Hi, my name is Dan Horner. Welcome to the Plants, uh, Consciousness and Me uh, Plants Medicine and Consciousness Workshop. Uh, um, the, this workshop is going to consist of uh, Paul Stamets, Dennis McKenna, myself, and Rajanish Khanna. Uh, we're going to have a presentation or a panel all together at the end. And first, uh, I'll give a presentation, and then uh, Rajanish will give a presentation on the tryptophan pathway, which is uh, fundamental to so many different species, uh, almost all of life processes. Um, I'm going to be giving a presentation first on psychedelics, quantum biology, and conscious evolution. So uh, I'm going to get right into it here in one second. Um, I just want to thank you for being here during these challenging times. I know it's been really hard on us all, and I just thank you for whatever you had to do to adjust your schedule to be here, and in particular for attending this workshop. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, one other quick note, which is uh, if you're a, a brain uh, scientist or a quantum physicist, I have uh, some ideas in this presentation for you. And if uh, I'd be honored if you could listen to those particular portions of the presentation, uh, if you listen to nothing else. So if you are a brain scientist, I hope you can listen to part one of this pre presentation and it's clearly labeled on the slides. So you could scroll through and get right to that if you're a brain scientist and if you're a quantum physicist, I do hope that you will listen to just part three of this presentation, uh, and you can, again, scroll through and just get right to it. Uh, I believe you'll be able to uh, have the ability to do that. So uh, I just have some ideas that I, I want to share with uh, quantum physicists and uh, brain scientists in particular, and, uh, and I, I hope that they'll be valuable to you. Uh, so just to uh, introduce myself, I am not a, a scientist. I am not a researcher. I am really, in this capacity, more of a scientific and spiritual uh, speculator and philosopher, and I do hope that my ideas are valuable to you. Um, so we will go ahead and just, if I can go ahead and get this screen share done, we will uh, go ahead and get this thing going. Um, I'm going to be giving really uh, a high-level view of just a few points that are really well known about in the scientific world. And they're going to be uh, three data points, uh, three data points. And I, and, and I believe that those data points will point us towards a hypothesis. And these data points, they're going to seem like they're, uh, they're going to seem disparate. They're going to seem like they may not, they may not have to do anything with each other, or they vaguely have to do something with each other. And if you're in data point two, and you're not understanding how it connects to data point one, don't worry, I'm going to tie that all together at the end. I, I believe you'll see that there's kind of an arrow pointing to the hypothesis, but uh, each data point will be, you know, understandable on its own. So this presentation in particular uh, for the Science of Consciousness Conference, this presentation in particular is, it's for everybody from scientists and researchers to lay, lay people and to philosophers, because I know that's who attends this conference and I've been an attendee for several, um, at, you know, several conferences through the years. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get right into it. Um, Plants, Medicine, and Consciousness Workshop. And then my portion here is the Psychedelics, Quantum Biology, and Conscious Evolution. And I will have a couple of sub-conclusions that may sound like rants. They're not rants. I promise that, that they're not. I won't do any ranting during this presentation. Uh, but uh, you'll hear those sub-conclusions in each of the separate data points, in data point one and three. So data point one, part one, is whatever your definition of consciousness, whether you believe consciousness is emerging from the brain, or whether you believe it's from the, you know, the qualia, the experience of life, or independent of the brain, if consciousness is totally independent of the brain, or if you believe consciousness is a universal concept and everything in the universe is conscious, and I'll, I'll quickly describe each one of these. Um, whatever your de definition of consciousness uh, happens to be, psychedelics change consciousness. That is. Uh, that is the major theme of part one here. So uh, the brain emergent theory of consciousness is obviously that when, you know, through evolution, we've developed these complex brains and it's through the uh, synapses in the brain and, and the electrical patterns and the chemistry that happens in the brain, that consciousness is just an emergent phenomenon uh, that happened in life that uh, really kind of I don't want to say happened by accident, but was driven by evolution over eons of time. And that's just uh, the brain emergent theory of, of consciousness. And there's a lot of data supporting that. I can completely understand brain scientists who would say, you know, if you 
lose your brain, you'll definitely lose consciousness. So brain, the brain and consciousness are completely linked together. Um, there's the quant concept of qualia, and I'm, I'm trying to give an overview of all the different uh, categories of consciousness, uh, the theories that are out there. And I feel like consciousness, for the most part, they fall into one of these four theories or a combination of these theories. You know, I haven't been to the conference in maybe two or three years, so maybe there are a bunch of uh, theories out there that I'm not aware of, but they seem to fall within these camps or some combination of these camps. So the second theory is uh, Dave Chalmers popularized this view. I think he invented this view. And he, if you don't know, comes to this conference uh, regularly and he's a, you know, a rock star presenter and he, you know, he's a doctor of philosophy and he um, kind of coined this concept of qualia. And, and that is to say, consciousness is a function of uh, the quality or the sensory experience of life. So you can imagine if you break your leg, you're going to be completely aware that you're conscious because you're going to feel that broken leg. Or if you're on a hot summer's day and you jump into a swimming pool, you're going to be very conscious that you're in that swimming pool and you know experience the sensory sensation of being in that uh, swimming pool. And so um, qualia is, you know, I've kind of summarized this in the into the I think and feel, therefore I am category of consciousness. Uh, consciousness is independent of the brain or of sensory perception. Uh, so this would include people that have had near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. Uh, surprisingly, if you're just open to being willing to look at the, uh, the, the information, the data, and the research that has been done in this category, you'll, you'll be shocked to find that there are really thousands of people that have had either out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences, a lot of them have been categorized, categorized um, studied. Um, there really is a decent body of research around uh, these uh, experiences for folks. And so a lot of the researchers or a lot of the people that have had these experiences might uh, hold the view that consciousness is independent of the brain and independent of sensory perception. And so that's just the um, consciousness independent of the brain, independent of the body, and independent of the sensory perception uh, view. And then there's the universal view of consciousness that maybe Deepak holds, or at least he talks about it quite a bit, that the universe itself is conscious, everything within it is conscious, the universe is conscious, consciousness itself in a sense. Um, tables are conscious and chairs are conscious and every piece of matter and rocks are conscious, the people are conscious and plants are conscious as well. There's nothing that isn't conscious in the universe. And that would be kind of the Vedantic view of uh, consciousness. And maybe you view, in that view, consciousness is still changeable, even though it's universal. Or maybe you view that it's a constant and you're just more aware or less aware of uh, consciousness being universal, for instance. So no matter which of those views you hold, uh, it's, it's, I think it's very safe to say that psychedelics change consciousness or our perception of consciousness. And uh, so first I'll address the brain structure view of consciousness. And here we see... Uh, an article about ayahuasca, ayahuasca stimulating the birth of new brain cells. So this is very common with a lot of the research on psychedelics that uh, here's one on ketamine. Ketamine helps neurons reload, regrow lost connections. This research was done on mice and psilocybin mushrooms stimulate the growth of new brain cells. So, you know, throughout the world, psychedelics the, the one place where I would say it's a little bit lacking is in MDMA. I haven't seen many articles or studies on MDMA promoting neurogenesis <clears throat> or the growth of new brain cells. <clears throat> but for the most part, uh, you know, most psychedelics are, are shown to produce neurogenesis and produce new brain cells <clears throat> and new structures in the brain. Um, you know, for, for instance, they did a study on ayahuasca and uh, they did. They they tested folks before and after they did ayahuasca one time, and they tested the BDNF levels, and that's uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is a protein that uh, occurs in the brain, and that's the protein that tells the brain to grow new brain cells. And of course, uh, they tested them before and they tested them after, and the ones that um, did ayahuasca, of course, had dramatic increases in BDNF uh, after they did ayahuasca. 
Uh, so you can see that it's clear most psychedelics seem to be producing uh, new, new brain cells. And this guy, Calvin Lai, was the head researcher here for this study, Psychedelics Promote Structural and Functional Neuroplasticity. And I pulled this particular line out of this study. Mr. Lai and his uh, friends there demonstrated that psychedelic compounds such as LSD is included, uh, DMT aside from ayahuasca, and DOI, uh, which is a synthetic uh, psychedelic, increase dendritic, uh, dendritic arbor complexity, promote dendritic spine growth, and stimulate synapse formation. So these cellular effects are similar to those produced by the fast-acting antidepressant ketamine. So as you can see, throughout the world of psychedelics, uh, brain, you know, new brain cells are growing, neurogenesis is happening, BDNF is happening. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, safe to say that if you have the brain emergent theory of consciousness, then you have to say that psychedelics change consciousness. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Psilocybe cubensis. It is uh, the psychedelic mushroom. And uh, so I'll just say, I just want to say here that there is a huge distinction between, uh, you know, most people in society, we've categorized all these things together as drugs and especially ones that are illegal as bad, you know, bad things, bad for you. But uh, I just want to make a huge distinction between MDMA, you know, with the, the family of MDMA, of, of psychedelics, including MDMA, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, LSD, ketamine. Uh, these are all substances that have shown to have a very uh, powerful therapeutic value. And there's, it's a completely different uh, family of, uh, you know, chemicals and, and a completely different category than, say, cocaine, heroin, crack, uh, meth. You know, these things are all harmful, even alcohol. These things are all harmful and they can really destroy lives and they can be addictive. Whereas these uh, medicines that I'm talking about, the MDMA and the LSD and the ayahuasca, these are all anti addictive, not just not addictive, but they're anti addictive. In other words, people. Uh, you know, use psilocybin mushrooms or any of these psychedelics. And usually what the experience afterwards is, I don't want to do that again. So they're not just not addictive, they're anti-addictive, where those other ones, the cocaine, the crack, the, you know, the meth, those things are highly addictive and can destroy people's lives, alcohol included. And I'll even go so far as to say, you know, there's been a misclassification. We have opiates, which were classified as a medicine and distributed to millions of people willy-nilly and lots of people have had their lives destroyed by opiates and opiate addiction whereas again these are anti-addictive so these are far less uh, dangerous far less you know they're not even addictive at all uh, as compared to something like opiates which, can, which is classified as a medicine so in any case uh this is uh the psychedelic mushroom so this is drugs and this is your brain on drugs this is drugs this is your brain on drugs, or at least a good kind. So here we have uh, on the left-hand side, you can see this is a person that took a placebo and that's their normal brain state. And this is what's called a chord diagram. Uh, what we're looking at here in the chord diagram is intercommunication among different regions of the brain. And the person on the right-hand side in part B is a person that did not take a placebo, did not take a sugar pill and took uh, a dose of psilocybin uh, through psychedelic mushrooms. And you can see the uh, interconnectivity and the crosstalk among regions of the brain that aren't normally talking that much or aren't, aren't normally uh, talking as much as they are there uh, is happening under the influence of psilocybin. So uh, we can be sure that the brain is operating in a different way. And we're, we can be sure that there are pathways of the brain that are being, uh, you know, used that are not normally used and used a lot more heavily than, you know, than typical. And so we know that if, if uh, neurons fire together, they wire together. So in, in any uh, a length of time, if you're using psychedelics, you're going to have new pathways happening in the brain because neurons are wiring together. So again, we know that the brains are structurally changing. Here is a picture of, uh, you know, the VHF, VEH is, is, uh, is someone who, who got the placebo or didn't get anything. 
And then the three uh, other ones here, DOI, DMT, and LSD are all uh, psychedelics. And with those psychedelics, you can see DOI, DMT, and LSD. You can see the orange portions are, uh, you know, these are the, the, the neural spines, the, you know, the spines growing off of the neurons. So that's the new, new part of the um, neuron that's, that's growing after the use of these particular psychedelics. So you can see there's a lot of growth, especially with, especially with LSD, you can see, you know, whole new uh, branches of that neuron growing off after LSD, whereas the VEH, basically there's, there's virtually no spines growing off of that neuron after, you know, the placebo. So again, we know that the structure of the brain is changing uh, when using psychedelics. Uh, right, so we can say safely that if you have the whole the brain emergent theory of consciousness that, uh, you know, psychedelics are surely changing consciousness when, uh, you know, after usage. Uh, secondly is people's qualia changes. So uh, obviously people have a much different experience of life when they're using psychedelics. And I'm, I'm not even specifically talking about that, but of course, while they're on psychedelics, they're, their experience of life is completely different. And so we can safely say that their qualia changes, but I'm more interested in long-term effects. And uh, what we have here is, you know, people are having long-term life-changing experiences through the use of psychedelics. So with, you know, these are all, I'm talking about all of these in a, in a therapeutic setting or in a, in a setting with a, a trained uh, facilitator of that particular psychedelic uh, I, I want to say, you know, psychedelics can be dangerous. They should not be used willy-nilly. They should be used in a therapeutic sesh setting. And that is where people are actually getting the most results. Um, I would hesitate to, uh, for anyone to use them in a recreational setting um, in anything other than very small dosages, but I, I don't even recommend that. I think uh, the, the greatest benefits that we can, we can call from psychedelics will be ha happening in a therapeutic setting going forward or in, uh, in ways they're doing where, you know, they're having retreats with trained facilitators for ayahuasca in South America, for instance. So in any case, getting back to the qualia, uh, with depression, you know, we know that people are reducing or eliminating depression through the use of psychedelics, you know, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, MDMA, all of these things. Uh, LSD, we know that I, people are reducing anxiety, reducing or eliminating anxiety, reducing or eliminating PTSD, addiction, or fear of death. So certainly if you're having depression or anxiety or PTSD or addiction or fear of death before psychedelics, and then you're, you're ha not having that or you're reducing that drastically after the use of psychedelics, then we can say safely that psychedelics change consciousness here. You know, if you have the quality of view of consciousness. So in this particular case, uh, just to highlight a particular study with PTSD, uh, this was uh, Rick Doblin talks about this uh, from the uh, multi, from MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. They're kind of the spearhead of a lot of psychedelic research in this country and really around the world. And they did this study with, uh, I don't know how many veterans, I believe it was about 100 plus veterans with PTSD, they had all been diagnosed with PTSD and they gave them 12 therapy sessions, 12 therapy sessions over the course of three to five months. Um, they took half of the, or they took a group of those and they interspersed in those 12 therapy sessions. Three of those therapy sessions were done under the influence of MDMA. And they, you know, they spaced them out so that uh, there was one group just getting 12 therapy sessions, one group getting 12 ser therapy sessions with three interspersed MDMA sessions as part of the 12 therapy sessions. And what they found was the group that didn't get MDMA, they had a 23% 23, 23 of those uh, veterans came to the end of that uh, 12 sessions of therapy and you know, completely relieved their PTSD, could no longer be classified as having PTSD. And uh, they checked with the, you know, they. They watched the uh, MDMA group, and lo and behold, they had a 56% uh, of the people that had PTSD before at the end of that study did not have PTSD. So they more than doubled 
the rate of the complete elimination of PTSD, where they could no longer be classified as having PTSD. And uh, what's really interesting is they followed up with all of those veterans a year after the study. And the ones that were part of the MDMA group, uh, they increased to 68% of them a year later, you could say did not have MDMA or not did not have PTSD. And so they had, uh, conti you know, continued to have some um, benefits in the year after the therapy with no additional use of MDMA. And the group that, d you know, did not have the MDMA, they still stayed at 23%. So um, they went from 56% and then they went to 68% a year later with the MDMA or 50, 56% and then 68% a year later with uh, the MDMA group, whereas the just therapy group stayed at 23%. So pretty impressive. But again, if you're having, if you have PTSD and then later on you don't uh, through the use of psychedelics, then psychedelics are definitely changing your qualia of life and your consciousness if you hold the qualia view of consciousness. Um, a lot of research is being done at Johns Hopkins on addiction and fear of death. And that's fear of death in terminal patients. Um, and you know what they're, they're using psilocybin mushrooms for people that have terminal cancer, for instance, and they're reducing or eliminating uh, their fear of death. Pretty impressive. And Roland Griffiths, who is the head of uh, psychedelic, psychedelic research at Johns Hopkins, uh, what he's finding is, it's, I think it's approximately 80% of the people that are in these studies, they claim, they claim that one, you know, the psychedelic experience that they have in the research is one of the three to five most profound experiences of their lives. So this is ranking up there with uh, getting married, with having their first child, with graduating from college. And they're saying, my God, this psychedelic experience was, you know, as profound to me as when I had my first child. And, and so again, if you have the quality of view of consciousness, certainly your, your consciousness is being changed if you're considering it to be one of the three to five most profound experiences of your life. Uh, here's just some examples of uh, the research being done. Uh, this was a, an interview by uh, Jeremy Hobson on WBUR in Boston, uh, how psychedelic substances can help treat anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses. So there's quite a number of other mental illnesses that are getting benefit uh, from psychedelics. Uh, I would, you know, I know like OCD and, and, and some other ones that people are doing research on, I'm aware of, I should say. Um, here's what we just talked about. Talked about MDMA shows promise as a PTSD treatment. Uh, the psychedelic science of pain, this is being done at UC San Diego. And they're, you know, they're reducing people's pain with uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, here's one that I like, and uh, Paul Stamets will talk more about this one, you know, in any, any presentation you see of his, not any presentation, but you'll see him talk about it later and uh, in other presentations. But this one's the effects of psilocybin on hippocampal neurogenesis and extinction of trace fear conditioning. This study was done on mice, um, but again, it's showing hippocampal neurogenesis. They, they showed that the brain, you know, the hippocampus was growing both in size and density of neurons. So you're having the brain structure change. And then in addition to that, they had extinction of trace fear conditioning. So they're having, having the experiential aspect of, uh, you know, their lives as mice being changed. Um, you know, they, they attenuated these my, mice, they trained them in kind of a Pavlovian way to fear a bell or a buzzer, and then they'd have the bell or buzzer and a shock afterwards. So once they heard the bell or the buzzer, they'd, they'd start to have fear they gave them the psilocybin and they were able to uh, create a complete extinction of the trace fear conditioning. So uh, again, this one's just showing you're having both the brain changes and you're having the experiential change at the same time in this study. And a little bit about the mechanism of action for how these psychedelics are working. Uh, they seem to all be working on what's called the default mode network of the brain. And this is a picture of the default mode network of the brain. And you can see that it's actually a network. It's not a particular part of the brain, uh, but you could consider the default mode network <clears throat> as kind of the, the neural equivalence of 
the ego. Uh, the, the, the default mode network is the self-referential part of the brain. So when you're thinking about yourself, you're activating your default mode network. Here's an article that they go, you know, uh, they go so far as to say psychedelic re research finds the ego exists in the default mode network. So um, depending on, you know, that's, it's hard to say scientifically that's proven. I'm sure some people would dispute that, but it's pretty much the neural equivalence of the ego, uh, you know, loosely, loosely speaking. And the default mode network will get activated when you're thinking of the past or the future of your own past or future. It's activated when you have internal mental state processes, um, such as self-referential processing, autobiographical memory retrieval, or imagining the future. So if you were, you know, autobiographical memory retrieval would just be a way of saying, you know, what happened, what happened, if you were telling me something about what happened to you last week or what happened to you in high school or happened to you 50 years ago, um, that would be autobiographical memory retrieval, just, you know, something uh, of your story in the past. And if you were to recount that, you'd be activating the default mode network. Anytime you're thinking of yourself, anytime you're imagining the future or the past of your life, you'll be activating the default mode network. Um, it also gets very activated when you have a state of vigilance. The default mode network is getting activated and um, it could possibly have implications in depression. Um, here is a study about depression. Uh, the excessive rumination that's happening in the default mode network when people have depression. So there's a strong correlation between the default mode network being kind of um, locked into place and uh, you know, going through this kind of default mode network loop where people are getting stuck in the default mode network when they're having depression. And uh, as you can see from this study, rumination is strongly and consistently correlated with depression. Uh, MRIs or brain imaging studies have shown that the default mode network is critically involved in that ruminative process. And again, we you know, we look at this slide from earlier and when, you know, the person on the left had a placebo and they're, you know, probably using their default mode network because again, it, it is the default. And the person on the right has this, is, is under the influence of psilocybin mushrooms here. And you're seeing this tremendous crosstalk of the brain of regions that aren't normally talking to each other. And the default mode network quiets drastically down in, you know, in psychedelic use to, you know, to being, you know, extremely uh, practically silent compared to the other regions of the brain in a sense. And that's one of the ways that they think it's the mechanism of action that they believe the default mode network and psychedelics, you know, are working. So psychedelics are turning that default mode network off and that helps allevi alleviate a lot of depression and the other areas of the brain are turning on. So what happens as a result of this massive increase in interconnection Here's an example with LSD, uh, how LSD can make us lose our sense of self. So again, you're, they're losing that sense of um, me, my, I, that egoic sense when, you know, not just LSD, but on most psych psychedelics, this is happening. And again, the default mode network, it's called the default mode network because it is the default mode of the brain. So if you are um, not engaging your brain in some other way, it will just go right back to the default mode network and you'll start thinking of yourself. Most people will start thinking of themselves and you know, their own lives if they're not engaged in, a, in something that's getting them outside of that. So not just psychedelics, but you can uh, quiet down the default mode network with many other things such as meditation, um, but you could also do it through playing a game of golf or you know, going swimming or um, playing a game with your friends or doing Sudoku or uh, washing the dishes. So as long as you're outwardly focused, uh, focused on a task, you can quiet down your default mode network. And I take it maybe that's why so many people like knitting nowadays or uh, adult coloring books, that sort of thing, because you're quiet, quieting down that default mode network. And that is a break for your, your default mode network. So um, I'm going to address uh, theory three and four here just in one slide because I think they're fairly simple. Uh, if you believe that consciousness is independent of the brain, such as near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, well, people have 
near-death experiences and, or out-of-body experiences under the influence of psychedelics, usually in pretty high doses and very particular psychedelics, but plenty of people have had out-of-body experiences and uh, people have what they would call a death and rebirth type of experience when you know, using certain psychedelics. So if you hold this view of consciousness, then you can easily say that uh, psychedelics are changing consciousness or changing someone's, if you believe consciousness is a constant and cannot be changed, then it's at least changing someone's perception and awareness of consciousness. So uh, here's an example, you know, this article of psychology today, and there's, you know, plenty of people that have reported having out of body or a uh, death and rebirth experience with psychedelics, usually under fairly high doses and very particular uh, psychedelics, such as, you know, ayahuasca and that sort of thing. Uh, theory four will address also very quickly, which is, you know, consciousness is universal. The Vedantic Deepak Chopra view, as I like to call it, of consciousness. Um, people, you know, very simply, people are experiencing what we call them altered states of consciousness, altered states of consciousness. So if consciousness is everywhere and it's universal and we're experiencing states that we don't normally experience altered states of consciousness, then you're at least experiencing more of what there is to experience in this universal consciousness. So that's part A and part B here is lots of people report having a state of oneness or a state of complete wholeness and a, a, a lack, you know, like a, a non-separation with the rest of the world. So they might feel at one with the world or at one with the universe or one with all of humanity under the influence of psychedelics. So if you have the Vedantic view that consciousness is user, universal, um, people are either experiencing more of consciousness or they're experiencing that, that universal consciousness itself, possibly. And so you, I think you'd have to agree that uh, whether consciousness is a constant and they're just experiencing more of what there is of consciousness or co consciousness is changeable in this view, then you're changing your consciousness under the influence of psychedelics. Ah. Um, so here's just an example of that, how LSD makes your brain one with the universe. So uh, there's an, an article there for you from NPR. Uh, Sub-conclusion number one, and I promise you that this is not a rant. I will not rant uh, at this particular time, but <clears throat> if we want to understand consciousness, if we want to understand the brain better, if we want to understand the, you know, the way the brain works, there is a huge multicolored blinking neon sign pointing to psychedelic research as the gateway in. And, uh, you know, scientists can debate whether uh, that metaphorical uh, multicolored blinking neon sign is actually multicolored and blinking, but I'm pretty sure there is a metaphorical neon sign, at least pointing to psychedelic, so psychedelic research as a gateway to understanding the brain more and consciousness more. I mean, if we're able to have these dramatic effects with someone having depression and then relieving their depression, you know, we're going to be able to understand a lot more of the, of what causes depression and the mechanism of getting people out of depression and all these other mental illnesses that, uh, you know, PTSD and anxiety and um, all these other things that people are able to, uh, to affect with uh, psychedelics. So if you're a brain researcher, I, I just strongly uh, hope that you will uh, at least look at the research on psychedelics. It's pretty profound and maybe include that into some of your research, research because it really, um, you know, what better way to study something than to, to give it some alternative inputs, you know, other than what it normally gets and perturb the system a little bit and see what happens. And I don't mean perturb it in a bad way, but most people are having really good things, you know, might be perturbing for a little while, but usually most people are very happy that they've done, uh, you know, they've gone through that experience. Oh, and by the way, we could probably in the process eradicate 50 to 75% of most mental illness in one generation if we could, if we could culturally adopt the use of uh, psychedelics in therapeutic settings. So no big whoop, right? So I, I, I do encourage any brain scientists or consciousness researchers to check that out. That was my, uh, my, my part for the brain scientists. Thank you so much if you made it that far. God bless you and good luck with your work. So part, part two, data point two, moving right along. Quantum science, uh, again, this is a disparate point. It seems like it has nothing to do with the first point. And then I will tie them all together at the end. So uh, in, in quantum science, quantum science seems to be saying, and the whole point of part two is 
the conscious observer produces an effect at the quantum level. So the conscious observer produces an effect at the quantum level, such as the double slit experiment. So if you are familiar with the double slit experiment, I'm gonna give a rudimentary understanding of the double slit experiment and you can just skip to the end of the conclusions of this portion if, uh, if there is indeed a fast forward function. But uh, if you, are, you know, don't remember the double slit experiment or only vaguely remember or you've never been exposed to the double slit experiment, then continue with me and I'll just give you a quick overview of the double slit experiment. So, uh, you know, this research was done the first time in the 1800s and repeated by the quantum physicists of the early 1900s. And what they did was they, they were taking single electrons in, you know, in, in the more recent studies, and they wanted to see what the nature of electrons were, and they wanted to see <coughs> um, what their behavior was and if they were particles or waves in essence. And they said, well, we think these are tiny little particles. We think they're, they're like tiny, tiny, tiny little marbles of matter. And we will shoot them uh, at this shield. Uh, and we will cut a slit in this shield. And we will have a screen behind that shield to record the results of our uh, electron firing. And we will shoot a ton of electrons, as you can see in the portion here on the front screen, where they've all landed around the, the slit. And then on the uh, screen where the results are recorded behind that, it shows a pattern that looks much like the shape of the slit. And they said, ah, look at that. They are like tiny little marbles. Uh, we think these electrons are just tiny, tiny little pieces of charged matter or what have you. And some people weren't so sure. And you know, this experiment had already been done in 1800 showing uh, that they look more like uh, waves. So they, you know, they said, well, if, it's, if electrons are particles, then if we shoot a ton of electrons and we do two slits in this shield uh, between you know, the electron gun and the, the screen that's gonna record the results, if we have two slits, we should see a pattern like what you see on the screen on the right-hand side, where you know, it's in the shape essentially of the two, the two slits. And we should just see this pattern like a little paintball gun shooting paintballs through and it's getting through only where the slits are. So they did, they did the, uh, you know, this experiment and the results were that, no, indeed, they did not get particles at all. Uh, electrons in this particular study, they looked a lot more like waves. So imagine this is like a swimming pool or you know, some sort of a body of water and these straight lines coming in are waves and they hit the shield and they, uh, they go through just where the two slits are and it produces this uh, pattern where there's constructive and, in, and uh, destructive interference patterns. And the, um, let me see if I can, oh crap, I can't get the mouse up. But the dark areas on that, uh, that screen where the, they're recording the results, the dark areas are where there's destructive wave patterns that the, the waves cancel themselves, you know, cancel each other out where you have the, the two waves coming through uh, you know, one wave coming through one slit, another wave coming through another slit, and they're canceling each other out um, with a destructive wave pattern. And then it's like water where if you have a constructive wave pattern, the wave will get twice as big in certain areas and, and cancel itself out in other areas. And that's, you're seeing where the wave is twice as big, say, in, that, in, in, the, in the bands where the light is, and they're having a constructive interference pattern. So they deduced that electrons are these uh, there, there are these waves, they have wave-like properties, um, but somehow they're landing in the screen still looking like they might be particles. So people were not convinced. And some people theorized, you know, maybe we're just shooting so many of these uh, electrons and particles that they're just bouncing off of each other and give it, giving us an effect that looks like uh, a wave pattern. And uh, so let's try this. Let's try shooting one electron at a time through the double slits and we'll see what happens. We should um, you know, see something different if we do that. So they tried one electron at a time <clears throat> through the double slits. And again, they got this wave pattern, the interference pattern showing that electrons must be like waves. And it's uh, even more peculiar because they were shooting these out of a gun and they thought they were shooting you know, single electrons. But when they go through the slits, it looks like um, 
that single electron has to be interfering with itself to be creating this interference pattern on the screen, on the, you know, the recording screen. So it's like, wow, we've had, we're, we're having an interference pattern shooting single electrons. So that electron must be interfering with itself. So it must look something like this where the waves are just coming in, you know, like waves of, uh, of the ocean. And so they got, they got, they said, you know, this is just, let's settle this once and for all. We're, once the technology got advanced enough, they said, let's put a measuring device here and we'll, we'll watch every single electron. We're still gonna shoot just one electron at a time. We're gonna do the same experiment, except we're gonna have a measuring device. And we're gonna watch what these electrons do. We're gonna see if we shoot them out of the gun and you know, if they're changing into waves and changing back, or if they're just you know, confusing us in some way that we're, we're just not aware of. So we're gonna put this measuring device they added a measuring device and did the same experiment that got them this uh, wave pattern. Add this, you know, this uh, measuring device of watching every single electron. And the electrons go back to acting like particles. Uh, when, when they added the measuring device, these electrons went back to looking like particles and produced just the pattern of the two slits on the recording screen at the back. So uh, they did the same experiment that gave them the wave pattern put in a device to watch every single electron and it gave them a particle pattern. So when they did the, uh, you know, did the, you know, shot the electrons without the measuring device, they got this wave pattern, as you can see on the left. And when they did it with the measuring device, watching every single electron, they got this particle uh, pattern and, and, you know, that was uh, perplexing, I should say. And also, you know, it caused a lot of controversy because uh, basically the, the, the bottom line of it all that uh, you came away with was that measurement produces an effect at the quantum level. And this is now called the conscious, you know, called the, uh, you know, conscious observer effect or, you know, the fact that you can observe an electron and it collapses into a particle. Whereas if you don't observe it, it stays in a, in a waveform, in a wave function. Um, that's kind of mind blowing. And it is the measurement that produces an effect. There, you know, almost all quantum physicists, there are some that don't agree with this, but almost all quantum physicists would agree that it, the measurement produces an effect at the quantum level. Um, many quantum physicists, including uh, many that attend this conference, uh, are in the camp that you can infer that it's a conscious observer that produces this effect because you're unable to have a measurement without a conscious observer. So in, in fact, they're saying it's the conscious observer that produces this quantum level effect of collapsing that, that wave into a particle. And, um, you know, waves are functions, they have a probability pattern, and they're in many places at one time, uh, or they had the potential of being in many places at one time. And they're not in one of those places until the measurement or the observation takes place. And there, again, there are, con there are physicists that will be at this conference that hold this view, such as Minos, a good friend of Deepak's and a, uh, a revered quantum physicist. And I think Roger Penrose would probably be somewhere in this camp as well, because he's working with Stewart on uh, quantum level effects in creating consciousness in the brain. So the conclusion, you know, all that just to say, just as a reminder, to say that the conscious observer produces an effect at the quantum level. So consciousness produces an effect at the, at the, at the quantum level. Um, or consciousness produces quantum effects. So that's the conclusion of uh, part two, data point two. So again, we're gonna go on to data point three and then I'll tie all these three data points together with a hypothesis and uh, no ranting for this particular one. So part three, data point three is just a high level view of quantum biology. I'm just trying to uh, explain the concept. I'm not a quantum biologist, but I just wanna acquaint you with uh, the concept of quantum biology in some places that it does happen in nature. So quantum biology is just the application of quantum mechanics and quantum physics to biological processes. Um, so, you know, we have chemistry that's happening in biology and at the very smallest level of that chemistry, the um, atomic level of that, you're able to apply quantum uh, mechanics uh, to explain some of the phenomenon that happen, uh, or at least to try to explain some of the phenomenon that happen in biological processes that they they can't figure out a better explanation for. So that's the gist of quantum biology. 
Um, quantum biology is not new. It was, it's definitely been around in, in this country research for at least 12 years. I think there's some studies that were done in 1999 as well. And it's been theorized, actually, this is, is wrong. It's been theorized in the 50s and 60s a little bit more so, but it was originally theorized in 1944 is the earliest that uh, some people are aware of. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, potential places that quantum biology is happening in nature, uh, photosynthesis. So these photons are hitting the chlorophyll and the plants. And uh, they believe that those pho photons are creating a uh, quantum biological process that creates the, the, the charge in the chlorophyll that, that uh, creates the reactions that allow the plant to grow. So they're literally taking, pho taking photons in and turning that into physical matter, kind of an amazing process. And they think that there's a quantum uh, mechanical uh, explanation for how photosynthesis is, occur is occurring. Uh, enzymes. So enzymes are catalysts to reactions. If you have two substance, substances that would normally react together and they, you put in the, the right enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, that reaction can happen up to 100 or even faster, 100 times faster than it normally would happen without the enzyme. So an example of this is digestion. You know, we, we produce digestive enzymes. We take in solid matter as food and within, you know, 15, 20 minutes, some of that food is already turning into energy. We're taking matter and turning it into energy for our bodies. And those reactions have to take place pretty fast for us to extract the energy out of that food. And so uh, enzymes are a place where, you know, uh, you know, these catalyst reactions where they think a quantum biological process is happening um, that speeds up that reaction. And it seems to be the best explanation. And I won't talk about photosynthesis or enzymes, but I am going to talk about DNA because it's relevant to the discussion here. And DNA is another place where a, uh, the best explanation seems to be a quantum biological process is um, happening when DNA mutates. So when DNA, I like to call it D DNA changes because mutate sounds like, you know, you're going to turn into a half frog, half man kind of thing. But, uh, you know, mutation is, is what would cause evolution. So if we didn't have uh, changes in our, in our DNA, we would ne never evolve past, I guess, being uh, monkeys. So, so I like to call it uh, changes in the DNA versus mutation but the correct term is mutation. So quantum biology was first theorized by a quantum physicist, uh, the famous quantum physicist, Erwin Schrodinger of, you know, he created the thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat uh, about the cat being both dead and alive in the box uh, that I won't get into, but essentially, um, you know, because of the dual nature of the uh, wave and particle nature of uh, in the probability aspect of uh, particles, there could be a cat that would be dead or alive in the box at the same time, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to know more, more about that, you can look it up on YouTube. There's tons of videos that will explain it to you. Um, Erwin Schrodinger, you know, he theorized quantum biology in his 1944 book, What is Life? And, you know, he said that, there, that in organic uh, chemistry and organic processes, there was a certain order that happened that didn't happen in inorganic, uh, you know, substances of the same uh, complexity. So if there was a certain level of chemical complexity to a particular substance, it would have a lot more order to it in a living organism than it would in uh, something that was inanimate. So uh, he speculated that quantum processes had to be taking place in, um, in biology. So... I don't know if there's anyone earlier than him, but he's probably the most well-known. Uh, his book, What is Life, in published in 1944, influenced Francis Crick and James Watson, the discoverers of DNA. And remember, DNA was discovered in 1953, so it was really only nine years after this book was published. Somehow they read it, and uh, it, it somehow influenced their ability to discover DNA. Uh, DNA, um, it is made of nucleotides. So nucleotides are these, um, you know, tiny compounds, and you put a lot of nucleotides together, it forms nucleic acid. And as you, you may or may not know, obviously, I would, I would think most people have heard of 
deoxyribonucleic acid, which is of course DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So, you know, deoxy DNA is made of nucle nucleic acid, and nucleic acid is made of nucleotides. So this is really the really base of your DNA. Um, there are four nucleotides in DNA. There's adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. As you can see here, the abbreviated A, T, and G, C. And these are called base pairs. A is always supposed to pair with T in the base pairs, and G is always supposed to pair with C. Uh, here's a picture of a chromosome, you know, a, uh, a, a diagram here. And you can see at the, across the top, it goes everything from A, T, G, A, C, G, G, A, T. So they can be on either side of that chromosome. But if you look, the A's are always paired with the T's across from each other. And the G's are always paired with C's across from each other, Wh whichever side the A or the G or the A or the, the T or the A are on, they're always paired together the same way. And there are 3 billion of these uh, pairings that create your chromosomes. Crazy stuff. So Crick and Watson, when they discovered DNA, uh, they, they actually theorized that DNA bases and, and these AT GCs are the bases, the base pairs. They theorized that these bases could themselves um, spontaneously undergo transformation to a state that would allow mispairs. So they, they kind of theorized that this could happen in the first place. And if you'll look on the left-hand side, this is an, if you're into the chemistry, um, you can see an AT base pair on the left. And in the middle, you can see that there are two hydrogen atoms and it's the hydrogen, these are the hydrogen bonds that hold the AT base pair together. And in the, on the right-hand side, you see the GC base pair, and you can see three hydrogen atoms, that H, that is holding them together. And it's the, the hydrogen bonds that hold the GC pair together. And for us non-chemistry people, it looks a little bit more like this, but the whole thing to remember again is just A pairs with T, there's two hydrogen, uh, bonds and G pairs with C. So in this particular scenario, there's a quantum, uh, it seems to be there's a quantum mechanical process happening where the T uh, gets uh, through quantum superposition that we briefly mentioned through, um, you know, it, it's, it's in this quantum superposition in this wave function. And occasionally a hydrogen atom will end up with the T where it's not supposed to be. It, 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 you know, chemically could not arrive there through the kinetic energy. And so they're saying basically the best explanation is it's in this quantum superposition and it has what's called a non-zero probability, meaning a tiny, 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 tiny probability of ending up with a T where it's normally not supposed to be and could not get there through its kinetic energy. So uh, T gets this additional hydrogen bond or hydrogen atom and excuse me, hydrogen atom and um, there's something called polymerase that is what matches the G and the C and the A and the T together. And it does so by looking at the number of hydrogen atoms and saying, oh, if you have two, you're either an A or a T, so I'll match you with an A or a T. And if you have three, then you're a G or a C. The polymerase looks at the G or the C and goes, oh, you have uh, you know, a place for three hydrogen atoms. Great, we're gonna pair you with your friend G here. But when T has this extra uh, hydrogen atom that is, seems to be getting there through quantum superposition, through something called quantum tunneling, um, the polymerase reads that T as a C and it pairs with the G. And it's not supposed to do that. So this is an example on the, you know, on the right-hand side, you have the G-T pair. And you can see in the middle, there's the three hydrogen atoms and the T on the right there has gotten that extra hydrogen uh, atom and now it's got a th uh, three hydrogen bond there. And um, that would be called what they call a genetic mutation. And that's not supposed to happen, but it does happen. And it happens in, in extremely few cases, but they, um, they don't exactly know how, but the best explanation seems to be that a quantum, you know, a quantum process is taking place there. So they tested this out at Duke University. And my understanding of the test is they added a uh, radioactive isotope, uh, I think version of hydrogen or somehow they 
they added a radioactive isotope to this, which is a very heavy uh, molecule or very heavy uh, atom that they added to this that normally, you know, based on probabilities, it would, it would not have as many probabilities in the wave function and would not uh, quantum superposition, you know, put itself in quantum superposition so that the number of times would reduce drastically if it were based on this quantum superposition because the, you know, because of the, uh, the radioactive uh, addition, the heavier uh, atom, it would, uh, based on the probability, it would not happen as often. And they saw that, yeah, indeed, it did not happen as often when they added this um, radioactive isotope. So they, they can, I believe that's how they did it. They inferred that it must be happening from quantum superposition that this extra hydrogen is happening without the radioisotope, if that makes any sense. So um, the whole bottom line of this, whether you understand chemistry or not, is that in DNA mutation, it seems like a quantum mechani mechanical process is taking place. That seems to be the best explanation for DNA mutation, for changes in DNA. And I will say that a sometimes does pair with C, which is a whole other process, but um, I didn't quite get into that one. And, you know, it's, you know, I didn't, uh, it happens, I think, less often than the GT pair. But the whole point is, you know, DNA mutation is how supposedly how evolution occurred and how, uh, you know, random mutation and natural selection is happening. So, uh, DNA mutation seems like it's being best explained by a quantum mechanical process. So that's the data, uh, the whole gist of data point three. And sub-conclusion number two, and again, I promise I'm not ranting, is that uh, if any quantum physicists, physicists are watching this presentation, this part's for you, and I, I'm honored if you listen to this, and I hope uh, it, uh, it, it lands or it's, it's an addition to whatever you're doing in your life and your research. But please consider, this is, this is my non-rant, please consider bringing your considerable talents uh, of quantum physics to the world of quantum biology. Rather than working in a controlled environment where singular particles must be cooled down to near absolute zero, how about studying quantum physics at the places where it's involved in the fundamental processes of life? Photosynthesis, all plant life, you know, all green plant life is you know, based on photosynthesis, algae, you know, it, it's without photosynthesis, most life on this planet would uh, become extinct. Uh, enzymes, so we've got all plants with photosynthesis, enzymes, all animals have uh, enzymes. So right there, all plants and all animals are probably having quantum physical processes happening in their biology. And then DNA, that's also fundamental to life. So any uh, eukaryotes or, or greater are, you know, basically have DNA. So uh, these, these are crucial linchpins of life. And it seems like there's quantum, uh, quantum mechanical processes that are happening on a, a grand scale. And yet we're, we're here trying to study one electron in a, you know, in a near zero temperature or one atom in a near zero temperature or building these super colliders of massive, you know, massive dollar super colliders to smash two atoms together. And it seems like um, there's this quantum physics that's happening uh, everywhere in the world and, and we could be studying it. And, uh, you know, if, if quantum, if this is where quantum biology or quantum mechanics is happening in a in natural environment and it seems to be happening all over, maybe this is the place where, you know, God invented quantum physics, you know, quantum physics for. So if, Essentially, what I'm trying to say here is uh, we, we could have these tremendous breakthroughs in quantum physics, not just in biology. We could have tremendous breakthroughs in biology uh, by getting more acquainted with and no more knowledgeable on quantum biology. Um, I'm sure it would lead to tremendous breakthroughs in biology, but it could lead to tremendous breakthroughs in quantum physics. And you might be able to do it at, uh, you know, with much lower uh, equipment costs <laughs> Uh, you know, you just bring your mathematics over to the biology department and talk about the chemistry and you might have some breakthroughs. So I don't know if that's too simplistic, but in any case, I do think that in the next 10 years, we're going to have some breakthroughs uh, in biology. And let's not forget, folks, all cancer is a result of genetic mutation. So, you know, we're, we're talking here about uh, DNA mutation and genetic mutation. And 
there is quite likely a quantum biological process happening that's creating that. So uh, I'm about ready to take all those disparate data points and put them all together, wrap them all up. Hopefully it's making sense to you. So my conclusion and hypothesis, um, just to recap, if psychedelics cause changes in consciousness and consciousness is able to produce an effect at the quantum level and, D and changes in DNA most likely uh, occur most likely as a result of quantum processes, then you know, putting them all together, you have DNA changes likely occurring as a result of quantum processes. Quantum processes seem to be affected by consciousness and psychedelics produce changes in consciousness. So then is it possible that can the profound changes in consciousness caused by psychedelics produce changes in DNA? So in other words, again, changes, DNA changes likely occur as a result of quantum processes. Quantum processes are likely affected by consciousness. Psychedelics produce changes in consciousness. So perhaps psychedelics could cause changes in DNA. So that's my hypothesis, something to think about. Um, part A here is, you know, getting right to it is it, it could be uh, support for the stoned ape theory that uh, was put forth by Terence McKenna and the two biggest proponents are Paul Stamets and Dennis McKenna who will be here at this workshop later uh, after myself and Rajneesh. Um, you know, could psychedelics have been responsible for evolution? We saw all the neurogenesis, that, neurogenesis that's happening through psychedelics, through, uh, and, and psychedelic mushrooms grow in animal dung all over the place, all over the world. So it's quite possible that our predecessors, um, you know, from a million years ago to 200,000 years ago, uh, were finding these psychedelic mushrooms that grow in animal dung and eating them and having psychedelic experiences and, and having neurogenesis. And quite possibly they could have had been having, I'm speculating that they might have been having uh, genetic changes as well. So, uh, you know, no one really knows why our brains, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a species increased in size so drastically between a million years ago and 200,000 years ago. But uh, psychedelics certainly are doing that today, changing people's uh, brain structure and creating neurogenesis. So even if it didn't happen in the past, maybe, maybe that's a stretch to you. Psychedelics, could they be responsible for consciousness, conscious evolution going forward? So, you know, we're sure that uh, brains are, are having neurogenesis and people's experience of life is changing. Uh, they're get, getting rid of depression, PTSD, anxiety, fear of death. So maybe psychedelics could be responsible for conscious evolution going forward. Uh, on the flip side, so one, want to make another point here. On the flip side, could we eradicate cancer and other diseases with changes in consciousness? And I'll make two points, okay? First is the adverse childhood experiences study. The adverse childhood experiences study was done by Kaiser Permanente. I believe it was on about 17,000 of their own employees who were, you know, middle class to upper middle class uh, folks that were not from uh, marginalized parts of society. And they found that about uh, two thirds of them all, all had what are called adverse childhood experiences and examples of adverse childhood experiences are if you're, you know, if your parents got divorced, if you were physically, mentally, or verbally uh, abused or sexually abused as a child, uh, if you, uh, you know, if, you're, if one of your parents died, um, these are all, you know, you can see the chart here if you had a household dysfunction, an incarcerated relative, um, you know, there was uh, alcoholism in your household, then these are adverse child, these are what are considered to be adverse childhood experiences. In this study, the uh, adverse childhood experiences or ACE study was um, just 10 questions. And if you had yeses to these, then you got, you got basically a point, one out of, you know, zero to, to 10, you know, your score would come out. And so they asked these 17,000 Kaiser Permanente employees uh, to rate it out and, and two thirds had adverse childhood experiences. And what they discovered was there was a direct uh, linear uh, correlation between the, you know, if you, the number of adverse childhood experiences you had and your likelihood of having certain diseases. 
So if you had zero, you had less chance of having cancer, heart disease, diabetes, mental illness, lost days from work, all sorts of, uh, you know, COPD, all sorts of illnesses that uh, were drastically increased the more ACEs you had. And, you know, they also looked at cancer. So if you have uh, four adverse childhood experiences, if you had four yeses on that uh, questionnaire of 10 questions, um, then you had double the risk of getting cancer. So four as opposed to zero, you double your risk of getting cancer. And conversely, uh, Dr. Kelly Turner, the author of Radical Remission, and when she wrote this book, she's talking about the radical remission of cancer. She said there are nine factors that occur in the uh, remission of cancer through alternative means. And she has a very specific definition of what radical remission is, and that is um, someone who used alternative therapies and did not use conventional medicine at all for their remission of cancer, or they used conventional therapies which did not work for them, and then they started on an alternative therapy regimen and did have remission of cancer, or uh, thirdly, they used both conventional and alternative methods uh, of uh, treating their cancer. And in the end, they were able to beat a cancer that had a very low survival rate. So um, maybe 25% or less survival rate, but with uh, both therapies, they were able to beat the odds. So th that's her definition of radical remission, but radical in, you know, in one of the, there was nine factors that uh, were in common when creating radical remission. And n factor number five is releasing suppressed emotions, which is what happens through uh, psychedelic use, you know, therapeutic psychedelic use. So we're saying if you have adverse childhood experiences, which I'm calling negative inputs to consciousness, you have uh, double the risk of getting cancer for adverse childhood experiences, and you have double the risk, you know, four negative inputs to your consciousness, you have double the risk of getting cancer. Um, if you have uh, release, if you release your suppressed emotions, it's a factor in having remission of cancer. And all cancer is the result of a genetic mutation. So uh, to summarize this, if you, if negative changes in consciousness can double your risk of getting a disease that's caused by genetic mutation and positive changes in consciousness is a factor in remission of, of a disease caused by genetic mutation, then changes in consciousness might produce genetic changes, either directly or indirectly. One way or another, it's happening, right? They're having these adverse childhood experiences and double, doubling the risk of a, of a disease caused by genetic mutation, and they're releasing their repressed, suppressed emotions and having uh, remission. You know, it's one of the factors in remission of a disease caused by genetic mutation. So either directly or indirectly, it seems like um, changes in consciousness are possibly producing genetic changes, not just epigenetic changes, but you know, indirectly they could be producing gen genetic changes or possibly directly. So in conclusion, uh, psychedelic therapies are shown to be one of the most powerful tools to address mental illness. I don't think um, that's in question at all. If you just look at the research, it's plain as day. Uh, perhaps they would also be very effective in helping relieve physical illnesses as well. Uh, again, just to summarize, DNA changes likely occur as a result of quantum processes. Consciousness likely affects quantum processes, and psychedelics produce profound changes in consciousness. Is it, it's possible that psychedelics produced evolution in the past or might be able to produce it going forward, and uh, it's also, uh, I'm saying psychedelics could uh, produce profound, psychedelics do pr produce profound mental healing, and it's possible that psychedelics may also uh, produce profound physical healing. So maybe we should focus on whether psychedelics can change DNA, uh, our lives and our health for the better. So thank you so much for your attention and listening. I hope you made it through all that. I hope it was all clear to you. And um, if you're a brain scientist or a quantum physicist and you listen to the part one or part three, I'm super grateful for your uh, attention and time. And uh, I just thank everyone out there who's watched this uh, I appreciate you so much. Um, I know it's been a challenging time for us all. And uh, stick around and you'll be able to hear Rajneesh's presentation about the tryptophan pathway being a fundamental uh, pathway in all of life. 
and then our panel here with uh, Paul Stamets, Dennis McKenna, and myself. Thanks a lot. God bless you. Be safe. Welcome to the workshop on plants, mushrooms, medicine, and consciousness. This talk is a companion talk along with the other talk that I presented in concurrent session four. Um, and, and, and in that particular talk, I talk a little bit more about the hidden signal, proposed hidden signal, and its influence on biological uh, growth and developmental processes. Uh, this talk is part of this workshop. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rajneesh Khanna. I'm a plant photobiologist, and uh, I have worked in the past several years in, the, in agriculture and food industries as a consultant and a researcher. In 2015, I gave this TEDx uh, talk in Livermore, California on uh, this uh, local food application that we are developing and uh, soon to launch in a few weeks. Um, I also have a company called iCultivare. Uh, this is a consortium of specialists, both from academic uh, settings as well as industry. Um, and we try to solve um, problems in agriculture and food industries uh, to uh, develop new products and uh, their applications. Uh, Classlight is a software uh, developed by my colleague, Greg Asner. And this Classlight software is used uh, to monitor deforestation. So these are my other uh, interests. Um, today we will talk about consciousness. And like I mentioned, uh, this is a companion talk uh, along with the concurrent session four, where I introduce the possibility of a hidden signal and uh, how it may uh, in, uh, influence uh, growth and development. Um, this talk is part of this workshop uh, and I highly encourage you to listen to Dan Horner's talk which is also part of this workshop, and then a discussion with Dennis McKenna and Paul Stamets on why do plants synthesize molecules with neuroactive uh, properties. Uh, and both Dennis and Paul uh, share some of the recent uh, data, and, and it was a really engaging discussion. So uh, I highly encourage you to go and watch that um, within this workshop. Uh, it's recorded separately. So let's jump into uh, the topic in hand, uh, which is consciousness. And I think um, uh, both religion and science have dealt with consciousness in slightly different ways. And in the past uh, decades, we have just started to scratch the surface uh, what, of psychedelics, which have been uh, known uh, by ancient cultures for a very long time. We are just starting to understand uh, how uh, they may uh, affect uh, our uh, uh, functions, brain functions, for example. But psychedelics are obviously working through biology, our own biology, uh, within the physical universe, in space time. And uh, I think quantum mechanics are probably going to play a role as we start to uh, understand more about consciousness. So I think consciousness is a complex, as is well described, uh, a hard problem. And to solve such a problem, we need to invoke multiple fields uh, including more experiential fields of biology and philosophy, uh, in addition to the descriptive fields of mathematics, physics, and cosmology. So I think we need to uh, uh, take a larger magnifying glass and uh, work together to understand consciousness. Uh, I know that information is probably going to play a role uh, in understanding consciousness. I think consciousness, in a way, is processing of information. Uh, so if we think of consciousness and think of describing it uh, some would say it's awareness, uh, some would say it's thought, uh, and some would say it's both. So if consciousness is awareness and thought and our ability to think about what's going to happen, we are obviously processing some information. Uh, and we are processing information when we are sleeping, when we are dreaming. If you are doing some really complex mathematical equations, and when you go to sleep, uh, you, you might dream about solving those equations as well. So. I think it's going to be information processing uh, by our biological systems uh, that is going to be uh, an important uh, facet of consciousness. Information is all around us. Light is a source of information. As a photobiologist, I think of light uh, as a package of inf information. Light carries information about 
uh, its quality, its quantity, its direction, its duration. Um, there, there is a frequency and wavelength a characteristic uh, to, to the light. The visible light that we can see is a very small uh, spectrum of the whole radiation that we receive from the sun. So light is a source of information. And this uh, is the first ever photograph of light, both as a particle and a wave. Uh, I really think this should have gotten uh, uh, more attention uh, when it was published in 2015 um, from EPFL. So uh, th this shows uh, very nicely uh, light as a particle and a wave. But this light photon, a particle of light, which is the photon, is traveling through space time. Uh, and we know that it's tra traveling at the fastest speed possible of 300 million meters per second. So light is able to travel through space time. And we also know that light will bend because space time itself can bend. And this is how uh, Einstein uh, got his fame. So we won't get into all of those details in this talk because it's out of the scope of this particular talk, but we will uh, acknowledge the amazing fact that light itself cannot escape a black hole. And so this is an image of a black hole um, uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope published in 2019. This is the black hole in the center of M87 galaxy. And this was a huge achievement, I think, uh, for us humans to be able to take this uh, photogram. There were multiple teams to credit for this, uh, but this is an image of a black hole. And light cannot escape uh, a black hole, however, uh, as uh, Stephen Hawking uh, suggested uh, and, and showed mathematically that uh, the black hole can have radiation, which is now known as Hawking radiation. So black hole is emitting uh, radiation. And again, there are so many details of it uh, at, at the very uh, physical level. We won't get into those, uh, those details, but uh, now we, we know that black holes can emit radiation. And uh, I think this starts to then uh, ask, uh, allow us to ask some bigger questions about singularities, uh, singularity of a black hole, what's the singularity of the Big Bang? And um, I'm, going, I'm skipping a lot of details here uh, just because of the interest in time. Uh, I wanted to get directly to inflation. So inflation, which is thought to occur between 10 to the power of minus 36 to 10 to the power of minus 32 seconds, um, and this is what we think, uh, occurred after the Big Bang uh, within that very short period and allowed uh, the universe to expand or, or inflate. And then we are undergoing uh, an expansion at an accelerated rate, uh, even now today, uh, as, as the universe is expanding. Uh, so, so there are several unanswered questions that I kind of went over very quickly, but th these are uh, some things that we are predicting or, or think are happening, but I think uh, we need to start to make some uh, some models where we can connect uh, many of these these uh, these hypotheses as well as some of the data that we actually have. Uh, so I, I personally feel that Sir Roger Penrose has has done a really wonderful job uh, in connecting some of these ideas, uh, especially in the conformal cyclic cosmology hypothesis, where the Big Bang occurs uh, sequentially. Uh, and, and what he calls takes an eon. Uh, so in, in this model, uh, and um, you know, I will present it very briefly uh, so that we can move on to our topic. But in this model, uh, the expansion of the universe continues. Ultimately, there is one black hole and then black hole uh, at the end uh, emits radiation, which we just saw as Hawking radiation. And that radiation uh, is then uh, left uh, after the, uh, uni the, the one um, uh, universe has gone through this cycle uh, until the next Big Bang and this cycle repeats itself. Uh, without getting into too much more detail, uh, I wanted to simply get to this radiation. So this radiation, uh, which uh, is, is uh, possibly carrying information uh, and does not have mass uh, because photons don't have mass. So there is no mass. Uh, and you need mass uh, for clocks to work. Uh, a a mass provides the frequency that clocks depend upon. So if this radiation uh, is what's left over after uh, the uh, black hole uh, emits uh, the Hawking's radiation and black hole itself disintegrates, then we are left with just radiation, 
with no mass. So all to say all to say all this, just to say that information can survive uh, without mass, and information can perhaps continue uh, into the next universe. So I, I'm just wanting to get to the importance of information here. And so this information, which is packed in radiation, can continue. This is, this is what uh, I, I think is, is possible. And I think it's an exciting possibility. So what is this information? Like we just discussed earlier, this information is a small uh, spectrum of, of light. Uh, here we are looking at just what we know as visible light, but that's what we know uh, currently. But I think uh, we are limiting ourselves to what we can measure. Information can be very broad. Radiation, uh, radiation that we can measure and detect, but it can also be uh, some other form that we cannot yet detect. Uh, as we know, 96% um, of the universe is undetectable to us. Uh, matter, the form of matter and energy um, in the 96% of the universe is unknown to us. So when I talk about information, I mean uh, information that may be known to us as well as information that may not be known to us yet. So this information um, is important. <clears throat> and we can only describe things about uh, light because we know of light as a package of information and what it can do to living organisms. Here I use an example, uh, Arabidopsis seedlings. Uh, which <clears throat> you can see when they're growing grown in darkness versus in red light or far red light. And when they're growing in darkness, um, they uh, elongate their hypocotyls and um, keep their hooks and cotyledons unexpanded. So these, these things on the top, we call cotyledons. And you can see in the dark, they are not expanded and they maintain their hook. This, this allows the seedling to, to penetrate through the soil till it sees light. And when it sees light, the... Uh, program of photomorphogenesis is initiated. Uh, and for example, here with red light or far red light, by the way, these are seedlings grown in continuous darkness or continuous red light or continuous far red light for four days. And we can see then uh, in continuous dark, they are growing in a very different way uh, in a program that we called etiolation or scotomorphogenesis, a very different from the photomorphogenesis program. And the two main uh, organs that respond very differentially to the external signal, lack of light or presence of light are the cotyledons and the hypocotyls. So in light, the hypocotyls are shorter and cotyledons are more expanded. So clearly uh, the seedling is able to uh, interpret the information from light, which is an external signal without mass. And this information is taken by this biological system and we fully understand involving photoreceptors and biochemical pathways and how it's manifested uh, into this uh, totally different uh, developmental program. So we're going to take a step further now. And uh, I have presented uh, and submitted for publication uh, this work uh, that I've been working on um, to suggest that the process of development, uh, which is occurring in uh, Minkowski's space. So it's occurring within the X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? So it's occurring within the Minkowski space. And this development is moving uh, forward in moments of time. And I think uh, there is a need for another signal to influence this growth and development through the process of time and or the, through the movement of time. So I call this signal a hidden signal represented by Aleph. Uh, uh, as opposed to uh, light, which is generally represented by lambda. So uh, I suggest that uh, there is another hidden signal that we have not been able to detect yet, and that it is required or needed for development to occur through time. And, um, and I, I also suggest that this signal played a fundamental role in the process of evolution. So to, to learn more about why I think that and some of the so the other uh, linked um, uh, processes uh, that may be involved in receiving the signal in biological systems, uh, you can watch uh, the concurrent session uh, four talk that I uh, also recorded separately. So in general, um, I'm proposing that there are many factors that influence life, uh, light, gravity, air, temperature, water, mineral nutrients, 
these are present on earth and they are highly variable uh, like we discussed light can be can vary in many different ways in its quantity quality direction duration gravity can vary somewhat in altitude or latitude but i would say you know mostly uh, maybe it's a constant for us that we experience uh, air uh, for plants oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, can vary a little bit on altitude and latitudes but the temperature water and mineral nutrients there they can be highly variable so uh, these these are the other factors and what i'm proposing is uh, a, a a factor or or a signal i call alif with this uh, symbol uh, and that it is undetected and it is present constantly and i won't get into the details of why i suggest this but i i predict that there are, there'll be some qualities of this signal uh, similar to light uh, for example speed so uh, this is the proposal that i presented in my other talk uh, and with that i also presented a thought experiment uh, which uh, that if this is true if there is another signal and it is working on biological systems this signal alif will will act to maintain growth and development programs in space time uh, and will guide the process of evolution and obviously a uh, quantum mechanics will play a role in this uh, uh, to translate the the influence of the signal into biological systems ultimately re- leading to these biological systems attaining their desired nutrient inputs uh, which was uh, you know stated by herbert spencer as survival of the fittest so i also present uh in my other talk in more detail uh a, a possible ancient pathway which may be involved in translating or uh, unpacking the information of this signal and that pathway i think is related to tryptophan uh, so in human brains um uh, tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin melatonin and niacin and i and most of the uh, psychedelics they act on serotonin receptors so i i think uh, there is uh, some influence on uh, our system on biological system uh, which is uh, triggered by information that is outside and uh, so if you watch the uh, other talk in c4 uh, i get a little bit more detail into those pathways and how they may influence um, uh, our um, growth development and also consciousness so the whole idea that i presented uh, partly here and also partly in the other talk is about information Uh, that light uh, is one source of information and that uh, in the absence of light there is there is uh, continuous information uh, which may be universal and some of it that we have not detected or we don't know of yet and uh, so uh, now if we connect all of these pieces together reality uh, i think is based on processing information and quantum mechanics is the mechanism or or is is a very early um, method of not only carrying the information but also allowing uh, the physical world to communicate with the biological world and for for us to fully understand that we have to use uh, the fields of philosophy cosmology physics mathematics and biology uh, together <clears throat> and so that we can understand the physical universe place ourselves in the space time micro space time i might add because we only take a micro space time uh, uh, during our entire lives uh, and and we uh, experience all of our biology in that micro space time and we experience consciousness so science i think can understand and describe consciousness but we have to expand our abilities significantly to be able to do that um and psychedelics provide a really wonderful gateway into understanding how uh, chemically or biochemically we may be uh, processing this information and by uh, by psychedelics we can see that uh we can alter our experiences of consciousness and that's uh, also related to the biochemical pathways and it is it has been known uh, to ancient uh, civilizations for a very long time and and psychedelics have been used in healing uh, because i think there there is going to be a, a process of this this entire pathway that i presented uh, which we are just starting to understand how it can be used to uh, treat ptsd and so many other diseases so uh, i think with this uh, we should continue to dream uh, and and um, and try trying to understand the depths of consciousness um, is is going to be an amazing journey and it will uh, give us uh, many more new tools and technologies 
that will only benefit uh, human uh, human nature uh, and, and human experience. Uh, and of course, you know, um, th there is an interplay between science and religion and uh, dreams and illusions and science. Uh, and I think uh, we, uh, if we start to understand the biochemical mechanisms, we will learn a lot about ourselves and, and try to control uh, uh, many, uh, many emotions and many diseases, including depression, uh, uh, which, which uh, currently uh, are a big problem uh, for our society. So with that, uh, I would like to just mention, uh, if you want to reach me, uh, you can uh, use this email address, rajatai-cultivare.com, and you can also visit some of the websites um, uh, and uh, you can get in touch with me. So thank you very much for listening. I am so happy uh, to have uh, Dennis McKenna and Paul Stamets with us today. And I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating discussion. So just to get started, uh, Dennis, would you like to uh, say a few words? Uh, yes. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Rajneesh and, and Josh for, or Dan, sorry, for, uh, for organizing this. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, I think we all anticipated we'd be doing this in Tucson in some very high-end resort. That's not happening, but here we are, each in our respective basements, and, uh, you know, we have virtual backgrounds, so it doesn't seem so bad. Uh, I guess people know who I am. I'm, you know, uh, I'm an ethnopharmacologist. I've been studying psychoactive plants for a frighteningly long time when I think about it, over almost 50 years earlier than that. I was a child of the 60s. Paul and I are almost contemporaries. He's a little younger than I am, but we're the same generation. And I think we came out of the same sort of background, just a fascination with nature and the properties of these remarkable plants and fungi, you know, which we encountered in the, in the first in the countercultural context. So I, uh, you know, and, and I have to credit my brother, uh, the, the famous or infamous Terence McKenna, who led me down the primrose path at an early age, uh, before I knew better. And we had some interesting adventures together and South America in the early 70s, which we've talked about. And then I went back to South America 10 years later to Peru to pursue my graduate studies in, uh, in ethnobotany or ethnopharmacology, which was basically a focus. My focus of my research was on the botany, chemistry, pharmacology of ayahuasca and that at the University of British Columbia uh, I was very fortunate to have a very uh, supportive and innovative supervisor, Neil Towers. So interestingly, when I first came to UBC uh, to study, I was going to do my work on uh, biosynthesis of psilocybin and the genetic regulation of psilocybin in, in psilocybe cubensis. I worked on that for about a year. Uh, we had permission to cultivate mushrooms and in the basement of the biology building at UBC, I had a growth chamber that I had requisitioned and I had regular crops, uh, which was interesting that made for interesting uh, gatherings and graduate students, <laughs> graduate student parties and whatever. Actually, I, I didn't do that. I was very responsible. But I, I worked on that for about a year. And then I realized that I was that I was failing fungal genetics, basically, you kind of have to understand fungal genetics, which Paul can tell you, very complicated, I wasn't getting it. So at some point, my supervisor said, Well, how would you like to go to Peru? And I said, my bags are packed, let's go. 
And, and so I ended up uh, shifting the focus to ayahuasca. And that's what I've been studying ever since in some ways. And uh, yeah, so I, I got my degree in 1984. I did a one postdoc in San Diego, which wasn't really relevant uh, to my interests. But it was a way to, when I finished my degree at UBC, they said, well, you have to go back to your third world country now and, and benefit your people, the United States. So I went back, I got that postdoc. I was lucky to get a, a postdoc at the uh, NIMH a couple of years later, the uh, Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology. And uh, I studied... Um, I started out, we wanted to maybe study ayahuasca, uh, but uh, as it turned out, I ended up working with another compound that people were interested in called DOI. And it was a very, very selective 5-HT2A receptor ligand, and we had radioactive forms of that. So we were able to do autoradiography with DOI. And I did that and then I continued uh, working and, and I was sort of in the process of going toward neuroscience, but not really feeling comfortable because I'm a natural products guy and I'm biased toward plants and fungi. So I, uh, I did another postdoc at Stanford and about the time I finished that, uh, there was a company called Shaman Pharmaceuticals that was starting up. And so uh, my supervisor at Stanford said, well, you know, you better go find a real job because I'm going to go work for Genentech. And uh, so I ended up working for Shaman Pharmaceuticals and I had all this receptor binding skills at my disposal. So I set up screening programs for their plant extracts. They were essentially bioprospecting. It was ethnobotany driven uh, drug discovery. <clears throat> I worked there for a while. And then I realized I couldn't really work for any corporation. So then I moved to Minneapolis, worked for uh, Aveda for a while. <laughs> kind of a left turn uh, looking for novel cosmetic ingredients in the rainforest. And then my brother died. He got brain cancer in 1999 and passed away less than a year later. I didn't know what to do. So I had an opportunity to start teaching ethnopharmacology at the University of Minnesota Center for Spirituality and Healing. And I did that for 17 years did some research at the same time. So uh, that brought me pretty much to today. My wife and I moved to British Columbia a year ago and I met, I met my wife, Sheila. Uh, you know, she was also a botany graduate student when I was. So we've been together a long time and, you know, she always uh, wanted to get back to Canada. Well, here we are 38 years later. So uh, it's good to be back in Canada. And, and now I've founded this nonprofit called the McKenna Academy, uh, which is kind of a think tank. Uh, Paul very generously provided some of the initial seed money to make that happen. And we're, we're going forward. So and congratulations That's my story, on... and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, I wanted to say congratulations on getting the uh, nonprofit uh, status, which you just received recently. That's fantastic. Yes, thank you, thank you. We set it up in Canada, and now we're setting up a U.S. version because it makes more sense to give people tax deductions if we administer it through the states. So we're doing lots of stuff. Our, our, our program originally involved a lot of doing retreats and conferences and that sort of thing in South America, that's not happening anymore for the foreseeable future. So we're just doing uh, virtual events like, like this one. I guess everybody's doing that, you know, this is the new, uh, new direction since people can't travel. So it's worked out well. Um, yeah. Paul, would you like to say a few words? 
Sure. I'm, I'm also speaking to you from British Columbia. I'm on a remote island. I came up to this island on March 5th thinking I'd be here for a week and um, I could see the <laughs> viral storm on the horizon closing in quickly and so here I am many months later. Um, like Dennis, I had an older brother uh, who mentored me, my brother John. He went to Yale um, and got a scholarship to the University of Washington in neurophysiology. And he was fascinated with psilocybin mushrooms, having experiences in Mexico and South America. And I was the youngest brother living in a conservative town called Columbiana, Ohio. And John went off to Yale. My other Bill, brother Bill went to Cornell. My sister went to Ohio State. And we had a complete laboratory in the basement, fully equipped. And so when they left the house, I was the youngest uh, son with my twin brother. And we took over the laboratory and I was just having the best of time. So my brother John had a huge influence on me. Um, he sparked my interest in psilocybin mushrooms. I went out to the Evergreen State College. I was living in the mountains in a remote cabin underneath a volcano, snow-capped volcano, um, and became self-taught. And I had to go to the University of Washington Library, Science Library, all the time to get research. I joined the Pacific Northwest Key Council, a taxonomic group to write taxonomic keys. I chose the family, the Stropheriaceae, which contains the genus Psilocybe, Stropheria and Hyphaloma, Nematoloma. These are sister genera, and that's why it was called Stropheria cubensis, then it was moved to Psilocybe cubensis. That just shows the interrelationships between those genera. And I spent a lot of time in the UW library. The majority of the articles, as Dennis can attest to, anything on psilocybin mushrooms had been razored out uh, from hungry, you know, people hungry for knowledge. So I met Daniel Stuntz, the University of Washington mycologist. He had his own private library. He took me under his fold. I ended up going to the Evergreen State College um, and met uh, my mentor to this day, Dr. Michael Bug, um, who then was, as an organic chemist, was called in as an expert witness um, in court cases where the DEA or law enforcement had busted individuals for putatively magic mushrooms. And some of these mushrooms were not psilocybin containing at all because of flawed analytical techniques. Uh, Michael uh, and wrote a, the proper protocol for identifying accurately the presence of psilocybin and psilocin, uh, published that. And because he was always on the other side of the fence to the DEA as the expert witness showing how their science was flawed, when he, after he published that paper, then he applied for a license for the DEA, uh, which we got. And so myself and the notorious Jeremy Bigwood, we were covered by that license uh, for a very long time, uh, which enabled me to legally grow psilocybin mushrooms. And my speciality was taxonomy and scanning electron microscopy. And the scanning electron microscopes were very new at that time. So I went on to publish four new species in the genus Psilocybe, co-authored them. Um, Psilocybe azurescens, the most potent psilocybin mushroom in the world, up to 2% psilocybin and psilocin combined. I mean, that's remarkable. 2% of its dry weight is a pure mm -hmm. psychoactive crystal. Um, then Psilocybe liniformans, Psilocybe cyanofrivolosa, uh, and Psilocybe wileyi, which I co-named after my dear friend, Dr. Andrew Weil. So my research um, was heavily on psilocybin mushrooms. At that time, I was treated like a leper. I would go to these conferences and I had long hair. I was interested in psilocybin mushrooms and it was like, you know, there was this like force field. I walk into a room and there'd be a circle of space that would <laughs> keep away from well, me. It made it easier to get to the bathroom anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I sort of just determinedly went on and Michael Bugue was a huge influence. He never shamed me. He was a fun to be with. Um, and because of these taxonomic groups I was involved with, I met all sorts of eclectic scientists who are also had, you know, specialities in lichens and algae and all sorts of other, you know, entomology and all sorts of other eclectic biological sciences. So I always dreamed of becoming a scientist, living in the country, having my own laboratories. I, I'm successful in that now. Uh, I um, have a small company and we're doing lots of innovative research, some of which I'll be sharing today. Um, I went on to write um, six books, um, uh, two field guides on psilocybin mushrooms, um, and two other books 
um, talking about how to grow them as well as naturalize them um, in the ecosystem. Uh, so these psilocybin mushrooms have a unique habit of following the de debris trails of humans. And so it was not until the advent of the use of beauty bark and wood chips for landscaping in the Pacific Northwest that suddenly psilocybin mushrooms show up on campuses. I mean, with like a sudden phenomenon. This is hard to emphasize. Dennis knows this well. Uh -huh. Prior to wood chips, no psilocybin mushrooms in the city. After the advent of beauty bark and wood chips, suddenly psilocybin mushrooms proliferated wherever they were used. And the mycologists and scientists were caught unawares. They had never seen these before. And so rather than having to go to Mexico or South America to find psilocybin mushrooms, they were suddenly all over the West Coast in particular of North America, always associated with universities and institutions of higher learning. <laughs> So the Daniel Stuntz, for instance, was inundated with students coming in, bringing in psilocybin mushrooms he'd never seen in 40 years. Um, so that was turned the psilocybin mushroom pandemic, probably not the best phrase to use these days. <laughs> <laughs> so I then um, continued my, my work. I, when I was uh, 22 years of age, I married a woman 11 years older than me with a 14, 16, and a 17-year-old that I adopted. And so I got accepted into multiple graduate schools, but I couldn't afford to move the family of five. And so I became self-educated and basically wanted to get access to laboratory equipment wholesale, but I couldn't afford to buy it retail. And that's sort of the, how my path has been chartered now. Now I have a, a um, utility, you might say, of being able to fund a lot of my own research and also to contribute to great people like Dennis and others who are have led the charge with both uh, spirit, courage, and kindness. Uh, and I think this is something that these psychoactive substances have taught us all, is how to be better human citizens and, um, and for us to do justice to the wisdom and knowledge that they've imparted to us. So that, that's Man. wonderful. Both, uh, thank you, Dennis and Paul. Uh, those were just uh, wonderful stories and just those all the hard work um, and, and well-deserved recognition uh, in the field. Uh, Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'll, I'll be a lot more brief. Um, my name is uh, Dan Horner, Joshua Dan Horner, for the, to clear up any confusion there with our guests. But uh, um, I'm, I grew up in Maryland. I, I went to the US Naval Academy. I spent five years in the service overseas. And uh, then I did four years on Wall Street. And then I, I got uh, ill with uh, what uh, the regular medical community calls uh, incurable illnesses, uh, the fibromyalgia, the chronic fatigue, and, and uh, many, many, a long list of uh, illnesses, a laundry list that's probably about 25 or 26. So I lost about 40 or 50 pounds, and I was my own guinea pig for healing for about four or five years. So I just went into doing a, a ton of research on my own. Um, that's all I could really do was basically be bedridden or do research to get well. And uh, I just continued to uh, find resources outside of the medical community that included alternative methods. And it led me to kind of the, 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 the meeting point between spirituality and uh, science. And there's a lot of science on what people would consider spiritual things and, and so forth. And uh, I cured myself and I healed myself, I should say, through, through the research that I did. Um, and I quote unquote, Healed myself of those incurable illnesses, and once that happened, I became uh, an evangelist and just started promoting that to the world. And that includes, um, you know, psychedelics and information on psychedelics and uh, many other topics. And uh, so I, I was the creator of the Arizona Plant Medicine Conference. And uh, um, in this context, I'm really just a moderator, um, I guess, a scientific and spiritual philosopher. <laughs> and uh, comedy sidekick for this uh, particular discussion. So thanks a lot for having me, gents. And uh, back to you, Rajneesh, if you want to go ahead. Well, thanks, Dan. And uh, it's yeah. been uh, Thank you. Uh, wonderful to work with you in organizing this particular workshop. Uh, just uh, about me, uh, I'll also keep it brief. Uh, by training, I'm a plant photobiologist. I uh, did my research uh, for PhD at Purdue University, then had an opportunity to come to UC Berkeley for a postdoc and continue my photobiology research. Uh, and it wasn't until I came across DMT, the spirit molecule, that my eyes sort of opened to uh, the possibility of external signals 
like light itself, which comes from outside of the earth and influences growth and development. So um, I was fascinated with the possibility of links between uh, psychedelics and information and consciousness. We will be focusing on uh, psilocybin and uh, ayahuasca or DMT. Uh, and as you can see, this is not my research. Uh, I uh, borrowed it, uh, but it is showing very clearly uh, on this scale here, which is the uh, the lethal lethality of the uh, compound. And on the other scale, uh, it's showing the dependency. So you can see that both psilocybin and DMT are at the lowest lethal scale and also the dependency scale. So uh, but their properties uh, are so amenable for medicine, medicinal uses. And uh, I am not surprised that there is so much focus on research on, uh, on these uh, compounds. So with this, I would like to switch my sharing over to Paul. Uh, Paul, you can, uh, you can uh, share your slide. Okay, Juana, just give also credit to Dr. Andrew Weil. Um, he was absolutely a huge pioneer in this on mind, uh, mind over body medicine. Um, he, he stimulated my interest and helped my research and, and helped me when I was a very young man when I first met him. Um, and so he, he's been a center pillar of this uh, movement. And I also conducted about 11 conferences uh, from the mid 1970s through uh, 1999 on specifically on psychoactive mushrooms at a time it was very controversial. And since I knew Alexander Shulgin and, and uh, a lot of the scientists that were involved in psychedelic medicine, I also knew the Merry Pranksters, uh, the Grateful Dead community, and I brought them all together. So sort of by two, I was a bridge between those two camps. And um, the Millennium Mushroom Conference of 1999 uh, goes down in history as one of the most uh, interesting, colorful, and outrageous conferences I've ever attended. <laughs> <laughs> we're organized. So, Okay. Um, so was anyway, that a Palenque, Paul, that conference? No, that was subsequent. Uh, okay. So this, uh, okay. So this is, uh, um, but let me go ahead and see if I can. I mean, so I'm going to just show three slides here. This is really important because the studies on psychedelic uh, in general, mushrooms, LSD um, in particular, had only a few institutions in the mid and late 60s. Um, and that because of and someone can blame Timothy Leary. It's the part of the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, the psychedelic revolution. Um, the popularity of the use of psychedelics and helping people change their minds uh, swept the, the country and the world and it became very populist. And of course, the war on drugs then was used um, and militarized uh, to suppress the voices of demonstrators, younger people, uh, ethnic minorities, et cetera. Now we are a different space um, in our in time and in culture. These are just the universities currently engaged in psilocybin and psychedelics. Uh, when you see that the DEA, the DEA, the FDA have approved these institutions for human clinical studies, they have, they've gone through IRB, institutional re review boards, they've passed critical thinking of the other physicians who've looked at the science objectively uh, and the results are so promising and so widespread um, uh, related to basic mental health and I will make the advocacy to neurological health and that's what I want to speak about later in this presentation. So these are the summary of the universities, not all of them. Here's a North Amer American academic centers that are involved in psilocybin research um, currently. Um, and then when you go into the European academic centers, Numerous uh, of centers are also uh, involved in studying this subject. So what I like this is a self-validation of independent pools of scientists who are conducting clinical studies with different targeted outcomes using different metrics, but the cross-collaboration, the, the uh, reconfirmation of prior results uh, clearly makes the case uh, unequivocally um, that psilocybin, DMT-related molecules, and these other psychoactive substances have their place in modern medicine for therapeutic use. Uh, so uh, we are not alone. Um, and uh, thank you, the University of Arizona, for pioneering um, this, this conference. 
Um, but this is just the beginning. Um, since your basic uh, neurology and mental health has so many expressions um, and are so core to our very existence and our sense of being and wellness, uh, there is a broad spectrum of benefits uh, if we can develop these medicines in a therapeutically safe setting. So that's all I wanted to say. And I'll back out. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think that that speaks to itself about uh, how lack of research in the past decades have really slowed down uh, where we could have been and how the new interest in the universities is, is a, a very positive thing. Um, and hopefully uh, we will uh, gain tremendously uh, from this. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, I just wanted to uh, then uh, focus back to the two uh, molecules that Paul just mentioned, uh, uh, obviously psilocybin, which comes from mushroom psilocybin and also uh, ayahuasca, which uh, the main ingredient is DMT or dimethyltryptamine. And here we are seeing uh, examples of, of both, uh, just to uh, think about uh, plants uh, that actually uh, synthesize uh, these molecules that can have such amazing impact on, on medicine uh, for us. And uh, I also wanted to set it up with a little bit of chemistry, but just not to get too deep into it, but just to point out uh, something very interesting, uh, which I find uh, quite interesting, which is tryptophan. So if we look at the biosynthetic pathways for DMT, for example, here, uh, about 1% of the tryptophan in human brain is converted uh, to uh, making serotonin. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this DMT uh, pathway in plants, which is what we are showing here, uh, like in, in the psychotrius where it is, uh, that is also being made from tryptophan as, as the precursor. The tryptophan uh, itself is synthesized from an ancient uh, pathway known as the shikimic acid pathway or shikimic pathway. And so this pathway has been around uh, from, the, uh, from the prokaryotes and which makes tryptophan and then tryptophan makes dimethyltryptamine. If you look at psilocybin, uh, that also has its uh, synthesis starting from tryptophan. So this tryptophan pathway, uh, which goes through these uh, few enzymes, multiple enzymes, three uh, mainly uh, well-known, uh, could be isolated uh, and cloned into bacteria, uh, E. coli. This was done last year, and this paper was published showing that uh, this whole pathway can be uh, uh, simulated or uh, uh, psilocybin can be produced in vivo in an E. coli in the bacteria, starting from uh, tryptophan uh, uh, compound. So uh, amazingly, uh, the, uh, the conservation of tryptophan and uh, uh, Dennis can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. I think um, we can count all of the psychedelic compounds on our hands, uh, which are linked to aromatic amino acids, uh, either from phenylalanine, tryptophan, and they're all made from the shikimet pathway. So we can all think of the shikimet pathway as an ancient pathway, um, uh, which uh, leads to the production of these uh, compounds. So I just wanted to mention this uh, and hand it over to Dan. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah, so thanks a lot, Rajneesh, for getting us acquainted with some of the chemistry there. And uh, so we'll get right into the first question. We want to ask Dennis, like, um, what, what functional role does DMT play in the ayahuasca vine? What, and then we'll ask Paul, what, what functional role does uh, psilocybin play in, in, you know, in, in the mushroom plant, in the mushroom species? Why are they there in the first place? Is there a, is there a, evolutionary reason or a, a, a scientific basis for why these, uh, you know, you're, you're on mute right now, Dennis, uh, why, why these uh, plants and why these mushrooms create psychedelic compounds? Dennis, you're Dennis, on mute. Is Dennis, is he talking? Dennis, you're on mute right now. We'll have to edit this out later. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes. There you go. yes. Yeah. So why, yeah, go ahead. I think that I think that both plants and mushrooms make these compounds not because they're psychedelic. They they happen to be psychedelic when they encounter a mammalian nervous system, you know. But they had they're much more ancient than we are, you know. I mean, mushrooms. I think I'm not sure what the evolutionary timeline is around 75 million years ago. 
Is that more or less correct, Paul? And, and the basidiomycetes. And psilocybin is a very ancient compound, you know. And, and the interesting thing about psilocybin, uh, I mean, many interesting things, but they, um, uh, they have interactions with insects. And there's been, uh, in the last few years, some very interesting things about this fungus, uh, Massospora, which is not even closely related to, psil to psilocybes. And yet it, it is a so-called entomophagus, of an insect-eating fungus. It, it infects cicadas in the ground and uh, it takes them over. It invades them and uh, it modifies their behavior. And this is not unusual for fungi. The whole, uh, there's a whole spectrum of these uh, insect Tiverous. Well, they don't eat insects, but they actually take over insects' nervous systems and direct their behavior. And the uh, the cordyceps fungi, for example, which is not which is different uh, than psilocybe. It's a different uh, uh, branch of the fungal kingdom, the ascomycetes. Uh, but there are many instances where cordyceps will form these parasitic relationships with insects like ants and caterpillars and termites and this sort of thing and actually direct their behavior toward uh, uh, spore dispersal. This is, this is basically the, the fungus's program is to maximize spore dispersal. And it may be that with psilocybe, this is totally speculation of course, but we see with the with the cicadas, they have this very interesting uh, relationship to uh, to cicadas, where the fungus will invade the cicada, and then when it emerges from its 17-year-long hibernation, it's already the fungus effectively destroys its abdomen and replaces it with spore masses. This particular fungus. Uh, also makes cathinone, which is the first time, and cathinone is a compound related to amphetamine, so it's a stimulant. First time it was identified in an, in a fungus, so it makes psilocybin and cathinone. It basically turns the cicadas into sex crazed maniacs. You know they run around and they, they, they'll mate with anything because they're in a state of sexual frenzy and because their abdomen has been effectively replaced with spore masses, this is a way to spread the spores. So there's that going on and that leads to the idea that, that why did psilocybin and these compounds evolve in the first place? There's reason to think that they evolved in order to drive insects crazy literally to that they were either repellents and or lures to insects because they've done studies with for example fruit flies and fruit flies will be attracted to these fungi but they forget to eat you know so potentially that's a pro a, a protective mechanism that the fungus has evolved and i think it's interesting when you look at the higher primates, you know, and, and you look at the association with the psilocybe containing fungi in terms of a symbiotic relationship, you, you know, and Michael Pollan, as you know, he's fond of saying, you know, uh, about things like corn, for example, you know, we think, well, we domesticate corn, right? But he turns it around and says, actually, corn domesticates us, you know. It, it's a it's a very clever strategy on the point uh, on the on the part of corn to persuade humans to grow it everywhere and that's success you know and similar things may be going on with with the fungi I mean these these symbioses are uh, uh, they are beneficial for the fungus because they facilitate spore dispersal. They're beneficial for us because we get 
desirable effects from us. And, and that motivates us to want to consume it, want to cultivate it, and so on. So that's, that's symbiosis. That's a, uh, you know, that, that's a strategy that shows up over and over again in so, nature. So it's and, very oh, interesting. So, so uh, Dennis, you made a good case that it's not maybe just mind altering, it's mind controlling. Uh, so mushrooms can use it to control activities of other organisms. Potentially, yes. You could look at it that way. You know, Terence famously said, uh, we are involved in a symbiotic relationship with something that has disguised itself as an alien invasion so as not to alarm us, <laughs> right? And, and I think there's some truth to that, yeah. uh, that, you know, this is a very ancient relationship. I think there's, you know, and Terence and, and other people, uh, myself, Paul, and other folks have brought forth this hypothesis about the stoned ape theory, you know, that, that early association with hominids and, and way back, you know, way back, maybe two million years ago, we're not sure, but we're pretty, it's pretty clear that hominids evolved in the African savannas and uh, there were cattle there, there were the relatives, the, the ancestors of Auroch cows also in the same environment. So the mushroom had to also be in this environment, you know, because the dung of the cow is the preferred substrate. And we know that Psilocybe cubensis, for example, is pantropical. You'll find that pretty much in any pasture in the tropics where cattle are present. This is probably the situation that uh, pertained about two million years ago. And as, as hominids moved out of the arboreal forest environments into the savannas, you know, they, the, these cattle-like animals or these cattle ancestors were a main source of their diets. And they could see through natural forest fires and this natural grassland fires, you know, they could drive these herds of cattle into ravines and over cliffs made it very easy pickings, you know. So anyway, growing up in this, evolving in this environment in close association with the cattle, there just had to be mushrooms there, you know, because we can see similar ecosystems today where these mushrooms are. And if there were mushrooms there, they had to be noticed. I mean, Psilocybe commensis is not, uh, you know, a, a little tiny mushroom that you might overlook. I mean, these are big, you know, and bright, and they have golden caps, and they're just very noticeable. And if you're a hungry primate foraging for whatever might be edible, you're not going to overlook it. They actually even taste pretty good, you know. Well, I mean, it's kind uh, of so. <laughs> so, you're, so you're, yeah, you're saying basically they're they're both uh, you know symbiotic, but also coevolutionary in that sense. Symbiotic and coevolutionary. And when Terence brought this uh, brought this idea forward, um, you know, thirty years ago when he wrote Food of the Gods, uh, there were a few things that we know now that we didn't know then, you know, and and what we know now which I think only makes his, his theory much stronger. We didn't know about neuroplasticity and we didn't know about ep epigenetics, but those two mechanisms actually make this plausible because neuroplasticity, which has been shown with psilocybin and other psychedelics that they essentially rearrange and enhance cortical uh, connectivity systems, right? That's, and you know, at, at the time Terence wrote Food of the Gods, it was thought that the brain didn't change. You had a complement of neurons at birth and it was, and you lost that over time and it was pretty much downhill. Well, now we know that some compounds stimulate neurogenesis. They stimulate both uh, 
you know, uh, they modify the connectivity of neural populations. They also stimulate the growth of neurons. And in fact, one of the main uh, components of ayahuasca, not DMT, but harmine, which is an MAO inhibitor in ayahuasca, but it also stimulates neurogenesis. So uh, neuroplasticity is the mechanism and then epigenetics supplies the a plausible mechanism for this being heritable through generations. Yeah. There's epigenetic it's, transmission, I, I, um, so sorry. it doesn't it, it, it doesn't depend on uh, uh, mutation, natural selection, in the same way we think of it. Pr prior to this, uh, prior to this portion of the workshop, I actually give a talk um, supporting genetic changes, data points that support genetic changes through, uh, which are different than epigenetic changes. So actual changes in the DNA based on quantum biology. Uh, that was what my talk is on, uh, data points kind of pointing to the yeah, okay. theory. But, but I think also, uh, also, also uh, uh, Paul has some data with the uh, psilocybin analogs and their, their effects. Uh, yeah, so. let's, let's get uh, to Paul's information. And Paul, what's your take on uh, on this? And, and let's talk about your work with the uh, psilocybin analogs. Well, okay. I, you know, this is a the big debate uh, between a pure uh, pharmaceutical compound, a single molecule, uh, versus a natural form that contains that, that molecule as well as very closely related analogs. And um, now the the stone ape is a hypothesis. You know, a theory is proven by fact. A hypothesis is an idea that's tested and by scientific method, and is, it can be factually supported. Um, I will say I got in a debate with a primatologist who absolutely uh, dis disavows that this has any credibility, and I was quick to remind him that some of the most uh, greatest scientists in history have also been equally uh, suffering from a chorus of skeptics who disavowed uh, their ideas later to be proved wrong. So one should be very careful. Mm -hmm. And moreover, uh, adding to this uh, hypothesis is that, okay, did it affect the brain? How did it affect the brain? How do we know that? Well, millions of years is not, you know, within our laboratory experiment times, uh, nor thousands. But we, we can measure um, neurogenesis in terms of neurite outgrowth with pluripotent stem cells. And that's some of the work that we've been doing since I don't have a DEA license and the psilocybin analogs are legal. Um, some of these analogs, you know, to be clear, psilocybin is a prodrug that dephosphorylates mm -hmm. psilocin. So psilocin is what's binding with the 5 uh, hta uh, receptors. Um, so there's other compounds, baocystin in particular, which is the second most abundant tryptamine in uh, the majority of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, and there's baocystin, nor baocystin, nor psilocin. Um, Baocystin is a prodrug to norcilocin, and it has been found recently by Alex Sherwood and his team of USONA, associated with USONA, that norcilocin is even binds more tightly with 5-H2A receptors. What's interesting is I have bioassayed baocystin, 10 milligrams and 20 milligrams, very carefully supervised by a physician who did my biometrics, um, slight dilation um, of the eyes. I was ready for liftoff. I'm an experienced psychonaut. I know, I know all the early signs. Um, and I have to say, I was disappointed. Um, I had no activity. So we upped it to 20 milligrams. Um, that's equivalent to about two grams of cubensis at 1%. Um, for those people taking the natural form, uh, 20 milligrams of uh, psilocybin. Um, and again, no, no activity. So this is really interesting because in the mouse uh, twitch test, which is a, a indicative of psychoactivity and a standard test using for testing psychedelics, um, baocystin would elicit that twitch test. The reason why I'm mentioning this is that if it crosses the blood brain barrier and MAO inhibition, monooxidation in inhibition is, is a factor here, but do we really know that just because it binds to 5-H2A receptors, does it change noticeably consciousness? Has anyone actually proved that? Nope. You could have these binding sites occurring without you quote unquote getting high or feeling an effect. 
And yet neurogenesis can be occurring. So I put it out to the medical community. I asked, I asked lots of dumb questions. I just don't see that question answered yet. Just because it binds, does it change your consciousness? Neurologically, we can demonstrate that it actually does cause neurogenesis. So is it possible we could have psychoactive substances causing neurogenesis that does not alter consciousness, but does in, improve neurology, uh, neurological health? So that's my lead up, and I'm gonna show um, just three slides here. So these are pluripotent uh, derived neurons of pluripotent stem cells. And we'd use, a, there's a, a saline control. Uh, there's brain derived nerve growth uh, factors, basically young human neurons kind of extracted um, as the positive control. Um, then we use lion's mane mushroom mycelium, which is the subject of several clinical studies, a fully legal mushroom, doesn't contain any, any psil psilocybin or psilocin. Um, and it caused um, in this seven days and six tipulate, uh, a 111% 11 increase in uh, the outgrowth of neurites. And then we tried it, Baocystin, Norobaocystin, and Norcilocin, uh, X, Y, and Z, not necessarily in that order. Um, these are legal analogs that we could test. We use Neur uh, Neurofit, a preclinical clinical research laboratory in France who screens for pre-Alzheimer's, uh, for Alzheimer's drugs, uh, et cetera. Um, and the results that came back were, were quite interesting, is that these non-psychoactive analogs, putatively, again, MAO inhibition being a cofactor here, don't fully understand that mechanism of action, but we did find that these analogs, which are present in these mushrooms, which are not present when you get pure psilocybin from a pharmaceutical company, you're getting one molecule, the natural form is giving you a consortium of these analogs which are also stimulating neurite outgrowth. So we did something that, you know, and I like stacking. And I mean, that's what we do every time you have a meal, every time you have lunch or dinner, you are stacking foods upon each other. Uh, we know about the adverse consequences, the beneficial consequences, et cetera. So with lion's mane mycelium, we had about a 14% increase. Now that's, that's before, you know, is a little bit less than that, but it's basically within the range of variation. Uh, with this, with this uh, silent, uh, the, uh, the fraction which called Z, we had 7%. We add those together and you get about 122% if they're acting, different, acting on totally different receptors. Um, and which is interesting because I mean, there's a chorus of receptivity, um, compound specific uh, to these different groups. So, there's an interesting synergy there. So the theoretical additive effect would be 122%. And in fact, we got 136%. That's, wow. that's amazing. So, so that, the, yeah, so there's an enablement here. There is synergism. So let's go back to the stone ape hypothesis. And I made fun of this for years, man. <laughs> it was a great dinner conversation, great when you smoked a joint, or you drank, drank, had, you had to talk academically, and how it was possible, you know, is improbable, et cetera. Well, bear in mind, 23 primates consume mushrooms, 22 not being human primates, we're a primate, and they have a history of knowing between edible and poisonous mushrooms. So Dennis and Terrence were absolutely correct that the probability of them encountering Psilocybe commensis on the, on the savannas, uh, our primate ancestors would encounter these and you're hungry, you're following animals, you're looking for tracks, you're looking for a scat, um, you bump into these, how can you not notice them? And moreover, it wouldn't happen one time or 10 times or a thousand times, it happened millions upon millions and millions of times over millions and millions of years. Well, it just takes one small clan epigenetically or however you want to describe it to have that sudden, you know, encoding of neurogenesis that's passed on, you know, to their progeny. So this, the, so we are eating composites. And I think that understanding that these analogs cause neurite outgrowth and we're continuing these experiments. We've brought them in house. We've repeated these results. This is not a one-off. We've done this, I think, four or five times, the reproducibility of results. We are seeing that these analogs are also, you know, help, uh, potentially helping mental health insofar as neuro outgrowth and neurogenesis, you know, speaks to that. So 
why go away from a natural substance with a pure pharmaceutical that costs that if you went to Johns Hopkins or some treatment center is five thousand to twenty thousand dollars for a treatment that's a, that is accessible, par, pardon moi, to, to rich white people, predominantly as a class, and, and, and the, not and, and and not, the, not available to the underprivileged. You know where they can you can get these psilocybin mushrooms for the price of portobellos, and then it allows for the universality of use. For the commons, yeah. and I think we have to s- stop the stratification of the availability of psychoactive medicines only for those people who are wealthy and who can afford these medicines. When really uh, the, the the PTSD that society is feeling is v- vertically from the top to the bottom and sideways to everyone. But Paul, so, that, that really leads us to the to the very uh, you know obvious next question, uh, which is. Why, uh, you know, you are showing very well that uh, isolating something doesn't have the equivalent effect uh, rather than having things together. And I think Dennis has spoken, I've been to his talks uh, about ayahuasca as well. Uh, you know, DMT itself isolated as a compound versus in its natural context. And so, uh, like you're saying, there is a, obviously a need for being able to patent things and uh, uh, regulate or uh, also administer in a more more controlled way, all those things are there, but how can we balance this? Uh, are there any thoughts in uh, moving forward? Is there an ability that we as a society can acquire to balance uh, having natural things, but also being able to spend money on research? And you know, I think that's what we really need to come out with somehow. Well, so my big concern is this, you know, having some experience in business, although minor, when a company gets investors, experienced venture capitalists, uh, oftentimes who are involved in funding a new company, a year later is disappointed by their performance and then sues them for a lack of uh, performing to the optimum of the investors, you know, uh, expected returns. So anyone else coming onto the scene, when one company has a hundred million dollars in investors, there's going to be a lot of investors there who are going to be adversarial to any competitor. Mm-hmm. So the motivation of that company now is to stifle competition. It's not to, to help the commons. The, I, the idea is to protect my investment. I invest a lot of money in you. Uh, why aren't you going after these people, even threatening them? Now, being physicians here, and I, I, everyone knows this, you can threaten a lawsuit. You go to your insurance company. They say, settle. But you go, I did nothing wrong. They said, it's not worth it. And so you incentivize the lawyers to file lawsuits, even though the other party is not guilty because they will concede this is not worth the bandwidth. Well, the stock uh, investors do the same thing. Let's go ahead and sue. So unfortunately, the the big 800 pound gorilla in the room, that 800 pound gorilla has now the ecosystem within it of decision-making to go after competitors driven by the interests of aggressive investors who will threaten to sue them if they don't. That is the problem. So I'm, I'm big into microdosing and the universality of use. Yeah. And, and, um, and I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's an important dialogue that we all discuss. Absolutely. And, and I, I just think, I think the research, you know, that re- the research slide that you show are really uh, great. Uh, you know, it's a great visual to say, uh, there's research on this everywhere, and I think you know education is really the key. Getting that information out to the general public so they know the benefits, so that there's a you know there's a kind of a public uh, knowledge about it that uh, produces the demand uh, in a different way, and and also um, just the, there's you know there's organizations like you know they de- decriminalize marijuana, and there's organizations like decriminalize nature that are really pushing for making you know all natural substances decriminalized. And I really think that's, you know, that's definitely a, an avenue well, as, for, yeah, as, as, as an example, in Denver, there was a petition to legalize psilocybin. Yeah. But, but not psilocybin. Hmm. Which means that only psilocybin would be legalized, but psilocybin mushrooms would not because the psilocybin mushrooms contain psilocin, and psilocin would be also an illegal substance. So it's that yeah. sort of Machiavellian strategies that some of these investors are behind in order to basically take market share 
unbeknownst, riding on the good faith and goodwill of scientists at universities doing research, saying this is a profound medicine of great usefulness for society. So, I mean, I wide open everybody. Uh, you know, the university and the researchers and physicians are naive when it comes to what's happening with billions of dollars within the pharmaceutical. That's, that's uh, why, yeah, that's why I had to leave Wall Street. Do you have uh, something to say, Dennis, there? Yeah, I think, uh, as Paul pointed out, I, I think these decriminalization movements uh, are a healthy thing. And, you know, I think we're, we're all for that. Uh, but as he points out, they, they're kind of wrong-headed because they didn't talk to any chemists, you know, before they brought these initiatives forward. And it's important that the... Uh, that these reform movements refer to the natural medicine. You know, it's, it's important that mushrooms be decriminalized. Now, it's also unfortunate that we think of them as criminalized. I mean, the very <laughs> idea that you can criminalize any organism is absurd on the face of it. And it bespeaks an incredible arrogance on the part of humans to think that we have the right to declare some, any organism, I don't care whether it's harmful or, or beneficial or whatever, we do not have the right to declare any organism as criminals. You know, the organisms are not criminals, the organisms are simply what they are. And I, I think that something that needs to be introduced into this discussion is the right to symbiosis. And, uh, you know, people should have, there's, you know, as, as fundamental principles, you should say no plant or fungus or any organism should be prohibited. We're just one of the species that share this biosphere. We don't have the moral or any other kind of authority to say this plant is prohibited, this fungus is prohibited. Who gave us that authority? So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is I think that we need to assure the right of people to form symbioses with any organism they choose to. And I'm not just talking about psychoactive organisms, I'm talking about any organism that we find useful to form an alliance with. And we should assert this, not simply as a human right, because we're talking about associations with non-humans. So it's a, it's a right of organisms to form symbiosis and it shouldn't be regulated by any government or any other legal framework. And, you know, when it comes to psilocybin and, and the, the research that's going on, I think we all appreciate that the research is going on, that it, you know, the benefits of these compounds are being recognized. But at the same time, there is this corporate element to it, this corporate co-optation by it's all driven by investment. Who's losing out here? People that might want to just utilize natural medicines, they should have the right to do that. They shouldn't be, you know, if you want to, if you can go to a clinic and pay $30,000 to have a clinical session with ayahuasca or, or psilocybin or any of these things, more power to you. Most of us are not in that position. You know, so we should be able to to make those choices. And then the other group that's been has always been marginalized and is still marginalized, and it's a moral travesty, are the indigenous people that have always been the guardians of this knowledge and the stewards not only of the organisms, the genetics, but the knowledge of how to use them, the traditions and all that. And... Uh, you know, this is what's always go, gone on. This is called biopiracy, and it happens again and again. You know, uh, colonialist dominator societies come to new ecosystems, find beneficial food or medicinal plants, and then they basically co-opt it. Any so they, reciprocity I, I, is an afterthought. Dennis, I agree with you, but I think mushrooms are exceptional. 
uh, because when it comes to ayahuasca, it's Brazilian Amazonia. When it comes to uh, aboga, it's it's it, it, it's in in Central Africa. When I when it comes to peyote, it's in the uh, southwest of, of of North America. When right. it comes to five mushrooms, the history of use of them in Greek culture and and Nordic cultures and Africa and Mesoamerica. Right. Psilocybin mushrooms are really different because they have been they they are associated with so many different regions of the world where those right. other medicines that you mentioned plants medicines are more uh, culturally ecocentric and with psilocybin mushrooms uh, I fully endorse and support indigenous peoples but let's not this bear witness to the fact and to be honest that you're in ancient European cultures, they were using psilocybin mushrooms and African, North African cultures, we have evidence that they were using them. So it's not specifically colonialism um, with psilocybin mushrooms because so many psilocybin mushrooms occur, there's 200 to 300 species in the world. Right, and right. They are associated with human activity. So this is something that's not as geopolitical in a sense as some of these other plant medicines of which, so I don't want to put mushrooms and plant medicines in the same bucket uh, when we're talking about- Well, and, yeah, I, I agree. And some, I mean, the, the plant medicines that are uh, sort of high profile in the psychedelic world are iboga and ayahuasca and peyote. All of these are linked to specific cultural traditions or not many like peyote, for example, is used in many different traditions, not nearly as many as as uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, but with these plants, there are also issues of sustainability, you know. And and the the you know these are threatened species, and they're 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 threatened mainly due to over harvesting and over utilization by non-indigenous people, you know, who have co-opted these medicines and, and are not making any effort to ensure sustainability. Mushrooms don't face that problem because they can be cultivated. But, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're all indigenous to earth. You know, I think that, I think that these medicines should be seen as the common heritage of humanity, not necessarily belonging to any ethnic group, but their role as stewards of these traditions should be recognized and they should be reciprocated. I mean, the, the, corporate, the corporate world should have their feet held to the fire in terms of, okay, you want to develop psilocybin as a multi-billion dollar medicine. What are you going to give back to the indigenous people? You know, uh, and I think this is a moral question that should be uh, discussed. Uh, that leads us right into our next question, uh, Dennis. And, you know, since, since uh, DMT can be synthesized and you can produce artificial forms of DMT, do you think, do you advocate this, you know, do you support artificial forms of, of DMT or even uh, psilocybin, you know, in order to reduce the pressure on these indigenous tribes and, and the demand for ayahuasca these days? Well, um, yes, I, I, you know, DMT is one thing. DMT can be synthesized. DMT is actually very abundant in the plant kingdom. It's not a rare compound at all because it's only two steps from tryptophan. And I would, I mean, we know certain genera like the acacias, like mimosa and so on. You know, there are many species in these genera. We talk about a few of them because they contain high amounts of DMT. Most of them, I would venture to say that 75% of all acacia species would probably contain detectable amounts of DMT or even substantial amounts of DMT. Same with mimosa. In fact, I would go so far as to speculate, this could easily be tested with the, uh, with the instruments that we have. I think all plants probably contain DMT, you know, not in high amounts, but in detectable amounts, because in some ways, they're two steps away from tryptophan. So they're, and, 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 and the and enzymes I, I, that affect that are common in, in cellular metabolism, right? Paul, interject. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, I would I'd like to add, and most all plant, I mean, all plants, with a very few exceptions, are infused with endophytic fungi. 
So the another good the point. <laughs> are producing compounds, either precursors or similar uh, similar uh, alkaloids or similar tryptamines that are are also part of this uh, of this narrative. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that people recognize and and indeed I would wonder if you can grow psychotria independent of its end in the endophytic fungi, you propagate it, and I do lots of cult, cult, culture work here, you do several generations downstream, would it still produce dimethyltryptamine independent of, it, of this its is of a, it? This is a good question. Uh, I mean, yes, probably, because plants are easily able to make tryptophan and transform it, but a, 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 an interesting example that you're undoubtedly aware of, Paul, you know, uh, so ergoline, ergoline derivatives, LSD-like compounds are found in fungi, right? The only higher plant genus or, or uh, family that ergolines are found in is the convolvulaceae, the, the morning glory family. It turns out the ergolines and morning glories are actually due to the fungal endophytes. If you grow, if you do tissue culture of morning glories and so on, and in the presence of uh, fungicides, it will not make the ergolines. So there's, that's an endophytic product that's found its way into the morning glories and is propagated in the seeds from generation to generation. And, and it is a question, how much of this secondary metabolism that we find in plants, which is tremendous chemical diversity in all classes of uh, so, uh, plant secondary compounds, how much of that is actually due to the endophytes, you know, and, and we just don't know. But I think a lot, a lot of it. And uh, so, you know, trying to bring psychedelics into the modern world, into global culture and biomedicine and all this, is fraught with a lot of challenges, you know, when it comes to who owns this knowledge, potentially nobody owns it, who owns the genetics, we need to get past ownership models in some ways. And, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I mean, corporate investment drives the science forward. And that's a good thing. But then the tendency of the capitalist world to say, okay, we made these discoveries and we own it. And, you know, if you try and tread on that territory, then you'll get hit with a lawsuit. I think these things, so I, I think that the decriminalization movements are a good thing in the sense that it creates another legal framework in which this can be done. You know, it, it seems that, uh, uh, you know, one of the problems with ayahuasca and ayahuasca tourism is that it's so popular. People go to South America to find, to take ayahuasca. That has some benefits on the indigenous communities and a lot of not so good consequences. And primarily one of the big ones is the depletion of the resource. The decrim movements open the possibility that we could create psychedelic treatment centers here in North America and instead of taking people to the medicine, bring the medicine to the people, you know, and say, okay, indigenous people, you grow it, you produce the product, export it legally to North America. Every community can have its own psychedelic treatment center which will look more like a spa than a clinic, you know? And I think that may be a solution, at least. I think that that, that gets around the other problem of isolated uh, substances as well. It brings the wholeness of the medicine uh, to these uh, treatment centers. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Play, yeah. I think isolated substances have their place. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that they don't, but I think by preference, and also in terms of being able to be within the means of most people, natural psychedelics, natural medicines are a much better choice. You know, it, it's economically out of most people's capabilities to, to go to these clinics, even, even if there are psychedelic clinics, 
you know, no one will be able to afford them unless insurance pays for them. Nobody has insurance, so it's a problem. <laughs> There's one other aspect I want to bring into this conversation, and I want to bring up another slide if I, if I could here. Um, and that is, um, let's go to share screen again. Um, just a second. Um, and that is uh, the concept of microdosing here, which I think is really important to have a discussion because it, by definition, it's less, it's less expensive um, because you're not using as much. You don't need to have the container of a safe, a safe place uh, in order to uh, be protected. Microdosing, by definition, is below the, the threshold. Um, can you see that now? Is that slide mm -hmm. visible? This is uh, the effect of psilocybin on neurogenesis and extinction of uh, trace fear conditioning. I'd like to bring up this article uh, by Catlow um, that was very important because basically it's, uh, they had mice put into a cage. Um, the mice uh, were given a, a tone. Uh, they, they got a normal, no reaction. Uh, they were given a tone. 40 seconds later, uh, the, the floor was uh, electrified. They were shocked. Well, after 10 rotations, when they heard that tone, they cowered with fear, just like Pavlov's dog, you know, ex expectation of, of, of a consequence, um, hearing uh, an audible, audible sound. So when they were totally conditioned to, uh, to, to cower in fear, uh, you know, uh, from hearing the sound, when they gave them a full dose of psilocybin, we're talking about a, a dose equivalent to, to uh, a journeying dose. Um, it was, it took uh, 10 rotations uh, under the influence or subsequent to the influence for them to lose that trace conditioning response. At one tenth of the dose, well below the threshold of intoxication or noticeable uh, effect on your consciousness, it took two. Think of that. Now, the other thing I want to bring up is that the advantage of microdosing is that you have this experience in six hours. How many cell divisions of your neurons do you have in, in six hours? When you're doing microdosing over a month, you have lots of cell divisions. And so the neurogenic benefits of microdosing compounded over time allows for downstream cell differentiation. And I think that speaks to the utility of microdosing where you don't need a clinic. You can treat uh, symptoms like depression, postmortem depression, PTSD over the long term. And so I think microdosing makes it affordable and you don't need a clinic necessarily to, and you don't be supervised by nurses and doctors for fear that you would have a bad experience. And so I think this, this idea of microdosing has a lot of merit. So, I, I like the idea of microdosing with psilocybin stacked with niacin. And niacin is a vasodilator. Uh, those of you who have the niacin flush, vitamin B3, nic nicotinic acid, um, you get really red and you, you start itching. It excites your, 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 your endpoints of your nervous system. Or neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as a deadening of the fingertips and the toes. So the fact that it's a vasodilator, it, it excites the peripheral nervous system at its endpoints, itching, et cetera. Um, and if you take too much, it has an ant abuse like effect. It, it has a, an effect that, that restricts the overuse of it. So if you took a tenth of a dose of a, of a liftoff dose stacked with 100 milligrams of niacin, you'd have to consume a whole gram of nicotinic acid, vitamin B3, niacin. And as we all know, that would be a very adverse event. So this is an adversant. So I like the idea of developing psilocybin stack with niacin for microdosing. It's much less expensive. You could do it also with a natural form of the mushrooms. And I think this could enable uh, the universality of use, uh, allow neurogenesis to progress over the weeks to be able to repair the nervous system. And we also should think about vision, hearing, coordination, um, the memory. And so, you know, I think psilocybin and these DMTs, so I think Rick Strassman called it the spirit molecule, or somebody called it the spirit molecule. I like to call it the Einstein molecule. <laughs> I think that 
the loss of intelligence to our society with age-related dementia and Alzheimer's is robbing future generations and current generations of the innovations that we need to have to create solutions to get us out of this mess today. Where are the Einsteins of today if they get dementia tomorrow? Whereas if we can have, and so I think there's a good advocacy for increasing the intelligence of our society by looking at this nootropic, uh, uh, redefining psilocybin as a nootropic vitamin. That, that's so, that's really, absolutely. So I, I just wanted to add quickly, uh, I think your suggestion of including niacin uh, seems very logical because uh, within the tryptophan pathway, um, uh, melatonin and niacin and serotonin, these are, these are all uh, products of the tryptophan pathway. So our brain is uh, already uh, you know, uh, accustomed to our doing uh, what you're suggesting uh, to help uh, niacin and then psilocybin uh, work together uh, to uh, to cause those changes, neurogenic changes, and that's that, that's really a, a fascinating idea. Has has anyone tried that, or uh, do you know if uh, it has been tried? Yeah, th this stack, which um, I'll go ahead and put it, is a the stack is now used by thousands of people. Okay. Uh, we have a new a new app at, at microdose.me. It's open sourced. It's by Quantified Citizen available on the iPhone. It has all these metrics of measurement. It went to uh, a review, medical review board committee up, up here in British Columbia. So microdose.me has a way of being able to chart your visual acuity, your memory, coordination, baseline. And then as you stack different things, the idea of symbiosis, like Dennis was talking about, or what I call mutualism, then you can disambiguate from a very large data set to see signal from the noise. And so in this case, because you saw the psilocybin analogs that I showed you enhanced neurogenesis as defined by neuro outgrowth, the idea is to stacking lion's mane, psilocybin mushrooms and niacin together. Um, and this then I think will have the, the you know, again, a, a greater than the expected additive uh, compounding of these compounds, we saw greater neuro outgrowth, stacking it with niacin has that ability. So there's a Fatiman protocol three, three days on, uh, and th uh, then four days off, I, we both just made this up. We have no really good reason for telling you this, except we made it up. So, um, but anyhow, that is uh, something I think that should be medically examined because um, it should be over the counter. A doc uh, should be able to, to be prescribed to anyone. Um, there is no abuse potential already. We know that, uh, but there's no intoxication effect. And moreover, you sort of, normalize to psilocybin at a high dose. I mean, I, Dennis probably knows this, and I'm one of the few people that knows this empirically. Try a heroic dose of psilocybin four or five days in a row. You get no effect on day three or four. You can eat five grams of cubensis and you have no effect. So you're not being intoxicated. Now what's happening to 5-HT2A receptors? And I go back to this. If you activate and bind to 5-HT2A are you changing consciousness or are you not changing consciousness, but you're building your better neurological networks? That's the putative, that's a question that I hope people at this conference can answer. I think, I think you've made that distinction, which I have not heard before. And I am really very fascinated with that, that uh, the activity on the receptor not necessarily is linked to consciousness. Uh, and, and the other thing uh, I've heard from reliable sources, and I think that the effect you mentioned with psilocybin is also true for ayahuasca. Uh, people who take higher doses of ayahuasca over after so several experiences, they actually want lower doses uh, to have, have similar effects. Uh, I think that's true. Um, so this, is fast, this has been a fascinating, I think we are running close to the end of it. I just wanted to summarize a few things that, that I think we all uh, discussed. First is uh, symbiosis. I, I, I completely agree with, with both of you that symbiosis should be a natural thing and should be allowed uh, why, uh, why stop symbiosis of people who want to uh, combine with other organisms? Secondly, uh, having uh, some uh, institutes where, uh, where a medicine can be brought from indigenous sources so that it benefits them as well, but having institutes uh, all across uh, more affordable, giving access to people, that's the second thing. Third thing that, that we introduced, or uh, all you mentioned, is microdosing, which could be a great uh, mechanism to get started and, and uh, uh, having access to um, uh, self-controlling uh, your own uh, 
uh, growth and uh, PTSD and things like that. Then, of course, all the research that moving towards the medical uh, uses, uh, which with more uh, direct uh, uh, approaches in medicine. So it looks like there are multiple ways how how uh, the the society can be benefited. Yeah. I just like to speak a, a, a bit to microdosing. I, I think that microdosing has benefits. Obviously, it can have benefits, and that's a good thing. And I, I think that the uh, data that Paul has presented shows that you know, in terms of maintaining cognitive function and possibly, you know, we're, uh, we're an aging population, we're becoming even more demented than usual, than normal. And so anything that can mitigate against that is good. But I think it's also important to remember that, I guess, don't let microdosing become a substitute for a full psychedelic experience because there are benefits to that too. And many people, uh, you know, they may microdose essentially as a way to avoid having a, a transcendent full on psychedelic experience, never really, I mean, knowing, but not really willing to experience that, you know, just around the corner, if you will, there's a world of wonder and people can benefit from experiencing that world of wonder. That's where much of the therapeutic effects of psilocybin comes, you know, in, in the clinical setting for these things like PTSD and addiction and, and the whole spectrum of things. Now, a full, full uh, psychedelic dose of psilocybin, then subsequently supplemented with microdosing, that can be very beneficial, I think. But once in a while, you need to go back to the well and drink deeply, you know. I, and I uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I do not believe, I mean, I see that DARPA recently funded uh, a researcher, Brian Roth, uh, who runs the uh, psychoactive drug screening program at the uh, University of North Carolina. I know Brian because we published together and he's a great guy. I mean, then it's uh, the psychoactive drug screening program is a very useful service. The government should spend more money, but they recently gave him, I think like a $30 million grant to develop non-psychedelic psychedelics. In other words, compounds that have the psychedelic experience engineered out of them with the same benefits to, to treat. I don't believe this is possible. I think that well, the... I, I, I spent two hours with the head of DARPA on that program. And after the 50th time, he used the term warfighter, 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 over and over. I said, I'm done. The <laughs> intention of this was to improve the warfighter environment. So this is the problem that academics are seduced by DARPA for money. But yes. The perfect intention is to make soldiers better killers. Yes. And this is morally deeply repugnant to me. Yes. And and we know we you know uh, work with other compounds I think is that propanolol can be given to people soldiers who have been involved in you know atrocities essentially situations of massacre and so on but uh, it just erases the the memory entrainment of those experiences. This is this is evil, actually. This is not the right thing to do. Well, and, I, I wish yeah, society I mean, would look more at the beneficial effects and and not always try to find something aggressive to do out of the system. And that that's just uh, general. Oh. I had a quick question. Uh, the, so through microdosing, you're not seeing any deadening effects of, you know, that you, you're talking about with the heroic dosing for three days in a row. So for microdosing over long periods of time, can you guys speak to that's, there's that's no that's deadening that's, effect? No, that's what we don't know. But as a, qu a question, if you're not flooding the receptors uh, as you are with a higher dose, those sept receptors may be unfulfilled. And so the idea of microdosing is you're titrating it at a lower dose. But the mouse experiment should be repeated and elaborated on. 
The fact that they would, could, could uh, lose their trace fear conditioning response in just two cycles on one tenth of the dose compared to 10 cycles with a full dose, you know, either this is a one off and is not, you know, representative, or this is a gateway into a, a very large behavioral study, uh, which could help uh, fight Alzheimer's and age related progression uh, dementia. I'm fully on board with what Dennis said, um, going to the deep well. And remember the studies from Johns Hopkins, et cetera, when they went and looked at people years after the experience, re-remembering the experience itself mm -hmm. had a therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. To what degree is that happening on the molecular level? With your receptors getting a dose of psilocybin associated with this heroic ex uh, dose experience, the therapeutic dose is in fact a re-remembering. We have to remember everything that we're using right now in this conversation is related to biochemistry. Every word that I'm speaking, every sound that you're hearing is basically that your basic neurochemistry, your neurophysiology of your body. And I'm wondering if not only the memory, but the molecule titrated at low amounts elicits the same response benefit that you would see in a therapeutically high dose. That, that's a question for the physicians here to explore. Hmm. Yeah, an, an important one. So uh, I don't know if we uh, if we still have time, and I, mean, I don't know if we'll get this edited in or out. But uh, you know, we are at the consciousness conference, so we wanted to bring up the topic of whether we think you know these psychoactive uh, fungi and plants they create these uh, mind altering substances. Do we think that plants have consciousness? Do we think that mushrooms themselves have consciousness? I know I'm shifting gears on everyone. Uh, we <laughs> touched on a lot of hot topics, but uh, we are at the consciousness conference, so. Everyone should know that fungi gave birth to animals. Humans are animals. Uh -huh. Do you really doubt that other animals don't have consciousness? No. Well, take it to this logical extreme. That which gave us birth, why would it not also have a form of consciousness? Not the one that we can articulate with words, but a form of consciousness that we have not yet recognized. I want to keep that idea open. I think it goes to the endophytic fungi inside of plants. We are these large consortiums of uh, organisms that are collaborating together. Uh, and I don't think that is limited just to the homo sapiens. That would be, again, hubris of the human species to think so. As a, as a plant scientist, I can tell you this is one of the very highly contested uh, topics in plant science. There are, there are very strong groups uh, on, on, on both sides, uh, well, more strong on the science side uh, where um, you know, it's very strongly argued that plants uh, do not have consciousness. So the questions are, like you said, are there are different forms of consciousness. What is consciousness? Maybe the question is, should we redefine what consciousness is? Uh, are we the only... That, yeah. that's, that's the most fundamental question. You have to say, what is consciousness? What do we mean when we say consciousness? And in, in some ways, I mean, I do believe that plants are conscious, that fungi, that basically everything is conscious. I'm, I'm kind of an animist in this respect, but I think there's increasing evidence that plants are conscious and fungal, uh, fungi are conscious, but not in the way that we are. But, you know, th this idea that you have to have a brain to be conscious is over is not necessarily correct. What you need is complex, hyper-connected networks. And fungi, that's what they are. They're hyper-connected networks that, may, that communicate through chemical signal transduction processes, just like nervous systems do. And there may be actually electrical signal propagation too in fungal networks. And similarly with plants, you know, plants are also tied in to these hyper-connected complex networks. Some of these, uh, you know, uh, clonal forests, for example, you know, you look at an aspen forest and you think, well, many trees, right? It's actually one tree, you know, it's a clone. And the same with, uh, with fungi, you've all heard of the enormous organisms that are uh, enormous mushrooms. I think it's Armillaria and other species. They're the largest organisms known and some of the oldest organisms and they're basically hyper-connected networks. And, and so 
consciousness, you know, how do we know that plants are consciousness are conscious? We can observe their behavior. <laughs> well, we think plants don't normally behave, right? I mean, in the way that we do, they don't have the fight or flight reaction. Their behavior is mediated through chemistry. You know, the language of plants is chemistry. And they use these secondary compounds. Maybe I'll put my slide up here and I can uh, just, you know. So this is a diagram of uh, plant metabolism, starting with photosynthesis, so solar energy, carbon dioxide, and water leads down these various biosynthetic pathways, producing basically the molecules of life. And the, uh, the classes of compounds in the blue boxes are basically universal. Everything needs these in order to, to live, or at least every plant. But in the red boxes or the yellow boxes, these are these secondary compounds. Well, we know they're not essential for life because not, a, not everything has them. But plants make these for one thing because they can, leaving aside for the moment of whether they have endophytic origins or they actually come from the plants. But these are basically messenger molecules. You know, these different classes of compounds you can think of as they're involved in signal transduction processes. So plants mediate their relationships with other things in the environment, other plants, fungi, animals, and humans through these different secondary compounds. And in some ways, sometimes they're simply, the relationship is, is simple. They're toxic, they're repellents. They're a signal to something that might want to eat a plant to stay away. Don't eat me because you'll be sorry. But in other cases, they are, it's more interesting when they are signals to come closer. Let's symbiose together. Let's form an alliance together because, and that's all mediated through these uh, chemical signaling networks. You know, the plant produces a compound that is useful to whatever might want to consume it. You know, and the obvious uh, activity is psychoactivity, but it doesn't have to be confined to that. Many types of relationships. So all of these different classes, particularly in the case of psychoactives, it's the alkaloids, the nitrogen containing secondary compounds. These are essentially messenger molecules. That's why plants make them to mediate these behavioral, behavioral interactions with other, other uh, organisms in the environment. So, um, you know, if intelligence is an organism's ability to optimize its relationship with its environment to, uh, you know, other organisms and other aspects of its environment, well, plants are very good at that. So I, I think that's an aspect of plant intelligence and there are other other things that are just remarkable you know there's a, some genera of plants you may have heard of them uh, boquila is one of them and also various uh, mistletoe relatives that are able to actually modify their morphology their leaf morphology to mimic whatever plants are growing adjacent to them that's a pretty amazing trick. How do they do that? I don't think anybody knows, but it's a very strange plant behavior. One short comment. I think you know, there's a bias of the observer. And I bet in this, in this room here in this conversation, whether plants or other animals or fungi have a form of consciousness, you could divide the room right in two. Those people who have not had a heroic dose on psychedelics. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Because yes. that would be a clear division. Because how do you t uh, tell a blind person what sight is? How do you tell a person who's deaf what sound is? How do you tell right. someone swimming what the feeling of water is? If you have not done it, you don't have the perspective. And so 
everything you're saying, Dennis, I fully uh, agree. And, and there's some intuitive truths. And I think that you've hit upon that. Uh, but I think if you are psychedelically naive, you're shaking your head in bewilderment saying these people are so unscientific and they need to get their act together. Yes. So, uh, yeah, anyhow. this is one reason why it's very hard to discuss these with anybody who hasn't taken a psychedelic because you can't really have a conversation. They just say, well, these people are hippies. They're, they're just nuts, right. you know. They, they haven't had the experience. There, well, there so is. I, so the, the, this is an interesting point here, and I, I know we are kind of uh, getting uh, close to the, but this, this is something important that I've thought about and is very relevant here. So uh, if I think about consciousness and how humans think about it, it's maybe thought. You know, we can think, we can decide. And they will say, well, plants are not conscious because I, I don't think they can think. They are aware. So we define consciousness as awareness. We are aware. Okay, plants are aware because of chemistry. So going back to this, this, this experience that you're describing, I think thought has something to do there. Um, you know, I, I, we can see that the thought has some origin or something is linked to thought. So for us to just think that only we can think and maybe in a way that we can think is the only way to think. Right. Maybe, maybe that's where the big divide is coming that we, we are thinking we are superior because of our ability to think and decide. Or maybe there are multiple ways to think and multiple ways to decide. This is why it's important to be able to step out of your reference frame temporarily, which is what psychedelics facilitate because we think, well, nothing thinks like us. You know, but you can take a psychedelic and then and in a natural environment and if you are, you know, open your sensory receptors, you realize there's all kinds of things. It brings the background forward in these environments. There, it's always there, but we're programmed to eliminate it, you know, because it is not... We're, we're programmed to selectively gate it out because it's not relevant to immediate survival. But if you open yourself up in a position where you don't have to worry about the saber-toothed tiger coming after you or whatever, or and just be gotcha. open, then you can apprehend the, the natural world in a much different way. I think it's closer to the way that indigenous people apprehend it. You know, and uh, there's a there's a, a writer Simon Powell who writes writes very interestingly about psilocybin. He wrote the psilocybin solution, and I think his latest book is called the Magic Mushroom Explorer. And the titles sound kind of funny, but an insight that he has that I really took away from his book is that something like psilocybin or psychedelics, their lenses through which you can examine nature. They are like scientific instruments. And if you, if you take a mushroom or a psychedelic and you go into nature and you look at a phenomenon, maybe you never noticed it before, but suddenly you get insights into how it, how it works. And, and it's not an invalid insight after uh, you know, after the trip is over, you can reflect on that. You can go back and examine it and say, yeah, actually, this is a real thing. It's always there, but it's in the background. And we are neurologically and every other way programmed to uh, suppress the background. You know, and one of, the, one of the great benefits of psychedelics is it lets you bring the background forward. And I think that's part of what the learning is, to uh, attune your senses in this way to processes uh, that are going on on the ecosystemic level that, you know, we, have, we Westerners, literate people, scientifically trained people and so on, we've, we've programmed ourselves not to notice it. If you go into the jungle with, uh, you know, a shaman, for example, who lives in that world, their experience of it is very different from yours, you know. And when when they when that dialogue goes on, they start to point out things that are going on. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I never noticed that before. But it, so you know, I do think these things are essentially scientific instruments for understanding nature. 
Uh, and sure. Um, I I, uh, I want to throw one last question in here before we wrap it up uh, because I've, I've uh, wanted to ask uh, both of you this for a long time uh, and I want to hear your answers to Rajneesh is um, why does the human body create DMT? You know, it's in the, it's in the lungs, it's being created in the pineal. I think there's it's being created in the gut. What uh, what reason do you guys uh, you know posit for the re you know that we have so much DMT in our systems? You're asking me? Yeah, Dennis, go ahead. You, you probably be the best. Well, uh, I think that it's it's just one of the things that the that the brain and body does because it's so close to serotonin or, or, or it's so close to tryptophan. It all comes from tryptophan. I think it's interesting when we, when we remind ourselves that most of the neurotransmitters that we know mediate consciousness, serotonin, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, all of these come from so-called essential amino acids, essential aromatic amino acids. Mammals long since lost the ability to make these things. They have to get them from the diet. So I think it's just interesting that, you know, the neurotransmitters that mediate consciousness are basically plant, plant metabolites, <laughs> which we have ingested. Uh, uh, but the question of why do we make DMT in the first place, there's been way too much emphasis on the pineal. I think the pineal has this mythical sort of uh, uh, aspect about it. I don't think it has that much to do with it. It's, it's you know, the, 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 there is DMT in the pineal. Does it ever release enough pineal to have an effect? I don't think so. But more recent research shows that DMT is all over the brain in the cortex, in the hippocampus, at levels comparable to other neurotransmitters. It's just another neurotransmitter, you know, and that happens to be psychedelic at higher levels. But, you know, I, I don't know if you know the work of John Chavez on this, uh, wrote this book called the, uh, strangely titled book called Questions for the Lion Tamer. Uh, but you, you know it, and it's yeah. basically about endogenous DMT. And, and his basic idea is that in states of high stress, the synthesis of DMT goes up for whatever reason. It's a response to stress, but it's always there. And it's there, you know, who knows? I mean, it's sort of like asking, what is the function of serotonin? Multiple. Probably the same is true of DMT, multiple functions. But it may be involved with modulating uh, or regulating our uh, focus on a external versus internal states. That's been speculated. I don't know. The answer well, we is, any... it's fun to speculate because actually nobody knows. So. <laughs> It sounds like it could really have a lot to do with imagination, and it's you know imagination, yes. beneficial that way. Paul, Paul, do you have any ideas on that, or you want to pass? And that's basically what psilocybin gave us over the course of two million years ago. It created or facilitated the human imagination, which in some ways is an ability to have make internal visualizations that are associated with meaning. Well, that's the basis of language and every other kind of human creativity. You know, a, a, imagination, dissect the word, image in nation, making images. That's what psilocybin does. Oh, anything? I just think it's, um, it's core to the universality of our being as biological organisms. Indeed. Rajneesh, any uh, your two cents on it from uh, Yeah, I, it, I mean, this this is uh, uh, a topic that I'm very interested in, and I, I think um, these uh, molecules are opening up some gates to perhaps information. So my hypothesis, which is what I've been working on, is uh, that if there is information just similar to light, uh, there can be, you know, we don't know 96% uh, of the universe, we don't know the matter and energy that exists out there. So is it possible that there is some other form of hidden energy or signal that is there 
and we are opening up the gates with, with this uh, pathway um, with the aromatic uh, uh, amino acids that they make these uh, compounds they are the gateways uh, initiating the imagination process but really really allowing us with our genetic makeup and our uh, location uh, on the planet so the space time and our genetics and our uh, ability to to receive the signal and interpret it to our own biochemical mechanisms to uh, constitute our consciousness so that's that's just some of the possibilities again all speculation and all we can do is speculate or and not. study and research and study and research yes yes Great. I mean, I, I think one thing psychedelics do is they remind us how little we know, you know, the limitations of our knowledge. There's an infinite, you know, science can be very arrogant in a certain sense because a tiny slice of reality, it can say, oh, we pretty much have this figured out, you know, but then there's an infinite amount of existence that's beyond the scope of science that we have no bloody idea what is going on. So that should be both humbling and exciting. You know, humbling in the sense that we don't know so much. There's no room for arrogance here. Exciting because there's so much left to learn. You know, Amen. You, yeah. Absolutely. So. So uh, I think that just about wraps it up for us today. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, it's been an honor to be with you guys. And I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone's looking forward to this presentation. Uh, everyone at home enjoyed it. And then you guys, everyone here has another presentation. Uh, Paul, uh, Dennis, and Rajneesh in this conference, there's a, a separate presentation. So if you want to hear more from those folks, obviously go straight to those presentations. And uh, we want to thank Stuart for inviting us to the consciousness conference and abby for her work in getting it all together and we look forward to uh hearing from uh deepak and noam Chomsky and all the other andrew weil uh and michael Pollan and all the other folks and hearing what they have to say about consciousness um any final parting words from anyone i'm, I'm i just want to say it's, it's been a pleasure uh, to be in company of uh, both uh, dennis and paul I, i'm really honored and thank you very much for joining us same here. It's been a pleasure interacting with everyone. Always happy to be with my friend Paul. He always brings lots of good ideas and, and uh, everyone here is just full of crazy notions that are worth talking about. So it's been, it, this is the kind of thing I like. It's been, I hope they like it at the conference, but it is what it is. <laughs> Uh, the greatest achievement of science, the acknowledgement of our ignorance. That's how I sign all of my emails. So it's an honor and pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day and uh, Thank you. blessings to you all. All right. We'll see you at the next one. Okay. Indeed. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.